Good evening, everybody. I'm George Peck. I'm the chairman of the Planning Commission. I officially call the Planning Commission portion of the joint meeting between the Planning Commission and the Historic and Design Review Commission to order. So Secretary, please do a roll call. Commissioner Sigaroa? Present. Commissioner Gonzalez? Present. Commissioner Christopher Garcia? Present. Commissioner Ozuna? Present. Commissioner Kostic? Present. Commissioner Brunson? Present. And Chairman Peck? Present. Is there a quorum? Yes, a quorum is present. Thank you. Uh, I am Michael Garino, Chairman of the Historic and Design Review Commission. I officially call the Historic and Design Review Commission portion of this joint meeting with the Planning Commission to order. And then we have a roll call for the ACRC, please. Yeah. Sorry. Guarino? Here. Betzer? Fish? Here. Wolf? Here. Bustamante? Present. Carpenter? Present. Grew? Here. Bowman? Here. Lafoon? Garza. Here. A quorum is present. Thank you very much. All righty. Uh, before we begin the presentation and allow citizens that are signed to speak to speak, each chair will provide a brief description of each commission's purview. For the purpose of this joint meeting, the Planning Commission is the recommending body for street closures, change of use of the street, and lease agreements. Final approval of these items is decided on by the City Council. Thank you. The Historic and Design Review Commission is an advisory board appointed by the City Council. It's the function of the board to advise the City Manager and all relevant City Departments concerning all applications for permits for properties in historic districts or landmarks on City property in the River Improvement Number Lane. In considering whether to recommend approval or disapproval of an application for Certificate of Appropriateness, the Historic and Design Review Commission shall be guided by the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation, City of San Antonio's Unified Development Code, and any additional design guidelines adopted by the City Council. We will now have the staff review our meeting procedures and speaking time for those who are assigned in to speak. We will begin with a brief, brief presentation of the proposal followed by citizens to be heard on the item. For those who signed in this up to speak for or against the proposed item, you will be called in order that you sign up to speak. Those in support and opposition will be allowed a maximum of three minutes per speaker, and you are not obligated to utilize the maximum time limitation. You will hear this when there are 30 seconds left. You will hear another beep, and I will inform you that your three minutes are up. For those that would like to give their time to another speaker, that speaker will be allowed a maximum of two people, giving their time for a total of nine minutes. Those giving up their time must be present and signed in to speak. When it is your turn to speak, please approach the podium, speak into the microphone, and provide your name and address. The meeting is being audio recorded, and we ask all comments and discussion be made into the microphone. We ask that everyone present be respectful of individual speakers and remain silent while each person is given the opportunity to speak. Participants who speak out of turn or are disrupted will be asked to leave or escorted from the facility. Thank you. Chair? Okay, right now, um, we will have a presentation by staff. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Lori Houston. I'm an assistant city manager for the city of San Antonio. Today's presentation will include several people coming up and presenting the Alamo plan. It's gonna start with myself. I'll talk about the background and how we got here. And then I'm going to ask Councilman Roberto Trevino, who is one of the treasurers of the Alamo Citizens Advisory Committee, to talk about the public process and the Alamo Citizens Advisory Committee process. And then after Councilman Trevino, we'll have Eric Kramer and John Kassman, who are two members of the design team, who will come up and speak for the Alamo plan itself. Um, and actually before them, it'll be Gene Dawson who will be talking about the actual traffic plan and then Councilman Trevino will close out. So um, we do have a long presentation, but it's important information that we need to cover so you all can be informed when you take these votes. So just a brief background. We have been working on the Alamo Plan for several years. Um, in 2015, the city of San Antonio entered into an agreement with the Alamo Endowment and the General Land Office for a joint master plan process that would help us develop a plan for how we redevelop and reimagine the Alamo. The agreement outlines the roles and responsibilities of each party and also helps us understand 
how we're going to provide the oversight of the implementation of the master plan that will ultimately be developed. As a reminder, I wanted to stress how complicated this project is. It is um, multiple property owners. So the city of San Antonio, we own the street and the actual Alamo Plaza itself. But the state of Texas, they own the long barracks, the church, and the 1936 garden, as well as the three historic buildings on Alamo Street. The city of San Antonio and the state of Texas finally are working together to master plan this important area. And the reason why the cooperative agreement is so important is this is the first time that the city and the state have worked together on planning and master planning the Alamo. Previous efforts to redevelop this area have failed because we have not had this partnership. The oversight structure identified in the cooperative agreement included an executive committee. That executive committee includes the mayor of San Antonio and the commission of the general land office. They um, are the oversight or the executive committee. Underneath them is the management committee that includes two members of the city of San Antonio, and that is city manager Cheryl Scully and councilman Roberto Trevino. Two members of the Alamo Endowment, and that is Jean Powell and Ramona Bass. And two members of the general land office, and that is Hector Valle and Brian Preston. And then finally, we have the Alamo Citizens Advisory Committee providing input to the management committee on the master plan um, since its beginning. And in fact, the vision and guiding principles created by the Alamo Citizens Advisory Committee serve as the foundation for the Alamo Master Plan and the Alamo Plan that we're presenting to you today. The first order of business for the management committee, who is the one who's responsible for the day-to-day -day oversight of the Alamo Plan, was to hire um, an Alamo Master Plan team. And so in 2016, we hired um, Preservation Design Partnership, which is led by George Scarmaeus, and they worked in partnership with GDU, there's Mario Shutman out of Mexico City, and Fisher Heck, who's a local architect here in town. The three of those teams worked together to develop the Alamo Master Plan, which was adopted by City Council in May of 2017. The Alamo <coughs> Master Plan, well, there were five key concepts. The first was to restore the church in Long Barrett. The second, was to delineate the delineated historic footprint of the Mission Plaza. Third was to recapture the historic Mission Plaza and create a sense of reverence and respect on the historic battlefield. Fourth was to repurpose the three historic buildings on Alamo into a world-class visitor center and museum. And the last one was to create a sense of arrival to the site and enhance connectivity between the site and other public spaces. That is the Alamo Master Plan and that was adopted by City Council in May of 2017. At that meeting, they also provided conceptual approval of several components. The first being conceptual approval of closing parts of Alamo and Crockett Street necessary to recapture the plaza. The second was conceptual approval repairing and relocating the cenotaph. And the last was conceptual approval of the future conveyance or lease of the portions of right of way necessary to recapture that plaza and that lease would be between the city of San Antonio and the general land office. After the master plan was adopted, the management committee went to the next step, which was to identify an interpretive planning team that would take those five key concepts and develop the site strategies necessary to implement those five key concepts. So we hired PGAV Destinations out of St. Louis, Missouri, um, in partnership with Cultural Innovations and Reed Hildebrand. Now, since May of 2017 to today, there have been a lot of revisions. We have been listening. There's been a lot of public input. Um, some of those revisions include <coughs> removing the glass walls, um, providing public access 24 hours a day, making sure that we have that solid space and community space, making sure there's great balance, providing more shade, and making sure that the cenotaph remains within Alamo Plaza. So we know we need to repair the um, cenotaph, but also our recommendation is to keep it within Alamo Plaza. Previous recommendations had it over on Market Street and the river. We also have come before um, to this committee with a plan that accommodates the fiesta tradition. So we've worked closely with the Battle of the Flowers and the Fiat Flambeau parades, so we can accommodate those important fiesta traditions 
that we've grown to love. We've also worked closely with the Cavaliers um, to make sure their investiture ceremony can be accommodated, as well as the Fiesta Commission's pilgrimage. And so we've worked quite a bit with the community to make sure that the animal plan we're presenting to you today is something that can not only be implemented, but it can be embraced. Now I'd like to ask Councilman Trevino to come up and speak to you about that public process. Um, he has been getting engaged in that process since he came out of the City Council in 2014, um, and he's been with us every step of the way, so Councilman Trevino. Thank you, Lori, and uh, thank you, Commission members. It's a real <coughs> privilege to be here today. Uh, I have the unique position of serving on both the Alamo Citizens Advisory Committee as a tri-chair and on the Management Committee as well. Um, and I also want to just thank uh, Lionel Sosa, who's, who's here. He's one of the tri-chairs for the Alamo Citizens Advisory Committee. And I know that there's some uh, Citizens Advisory Committee members. If they could please stand and be recognized, I just want to thank them publicly for being here. Um, as you can see, thank you so much for being here, guys. Um, this has been an important process, and I think a, an incredibly robust process uh, that has included, uh, since 2014, as you can see, over 50 public meetings, uh, 200 public stake, uh, stakeholder meetings. Uh, of course, that doesn't even include the, the archaeology that we did during the campaign. There was 19 briefings where we uh, set up uh, archaeological briefings every single day and it was followed by over 100,000 viewers. Uh, it, was, it was pretty amazing. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. As you can see we've had, uh, we have 30 members and the Citizen Advisory Committee members and, and these are the folks, uh, some representative as council appointees. Every district had an appointee as well as the mayor's office and of course different sectors of the state of Texas, history and archaeology, uh, Alamo Plaza Committee and of course uh, Technical Committee as well. Uh, this is important because we want to point out that this is a diverse group, a, a, a hard-working diverse group and since 2014 it, is, it has changed somewhat but we've had some members that, that have been around since 2014 and we're certainly proud of their work. Go to the next slide. Um, Ken, the, the plan proposed by the consultant team further developed the proposal strategies uh, necessary to achieve the five key concepts in the master plan. And what you see here is uh, the more prominent site strategies include closing the re and restricting sections of Alamo Street, Houston Street, Crockett Street to pedestrian and emergency vehicles only, repairing the reloc and relocating the cenotaph within Alamo Plaza, uh, developing a new parade route that honors <laughs> the complete history of the Alamo, assessing the adaptive reuse for the Crockett Palace Woolworth buildings and establishing a, a formal point of entry to the plaza during museum hours and leasing to the GLO portions of the street plaza necessary to recapture the plaza. And of course, on October 30th, you can see here, um, the, the Citizens Advisory Committee was asked to take a position on each of these strategies. If we can go back one slide, just, just to recap, and just point out, again, we had seven resolutions, five were support, supported unanimously, uh, two, uh, 92% and 96%. Uh, consensus and of course I would like to to discuss these items and so as you can see these are the major strategies for consideration the street closures parades cenotaph relocation plaza access and historic buildings and of course the the street and traffic plan will be uh, further explained by Gene Dawson uh, after I speak we'll go to the next slide so the first is the parade route of course uh, we worked very hard with, with uh, Battle of Flowers, Fiesta Flambeau, Texas Cavaliers, uh, and the Fiesta Commission, and I think we found common ground. Uh, we, we talked about the tradition that honors the participants of the Battle of the Alamo. We want to know that uh, we're going to venerate the known burial grounds, and of course, keep the traditions. And at the heart of this is that this is a plan that is really about revealing all the history at the Alamo. Uh, we, we're not trying to get rid of anything. We're simply saying we want to make room for more. And this is a great example of how we accomplished that. We, we uh, created, uh, we worked with the Battle of Flowers people to try to create a better way forward. We'll go to the next slide. You can see the current route uh, of the parade route goes down Alamo Street, and there's bleachers set up along Alamo Street. Uh, it stops at the front of the church as part of their tradition. They drop off their floral tribute. A cadet drops off that 
uh, bouquet in front of the, the, the church at the Alamo. Go to the next slide. This was the compromise that we worked out. Uh, essentially, uh, you can see there that we've recaptured the admission historic footprint, and the parade route is now outside of that historic footprint. Uh, whether you come from the east or the west, you will arrive at a ceremonial activity zone. Let me go to the next slide. And you can see the parade will, be, it will still be in proximity to the site. Next slide, please. And you know we, we demonstrated that the traditions would actually be enhanced because of what we're doing. By revealing more of the history and, and showing that, that the, the elements that are part of the, the, the Battle of Flowers Parade and, and, of course, other traditions that occur on site, uh, we actually enhance those, those elements, enrich that experience. And so uh, the next is also to assess the adaptive reuse potential for Crockett Palace and Woolworth buildings. Uh, this is an important part of, of what uh, we're trying to accomplish on site as well. Again, we're not trying to get rid of any, any of the elements existing on site. We're simply making room for more. And so these buildings sit on top of part of the footprint. And if we can go to the next slide, you can see that this is uh, part of what we've studied. Uh, you have three different buildings independent of one another. Uh, different floor plate heights, you have uh, different structural grids, um, but essentially part of the footprint sits inside of the original historic footprint. And uh, how do we go about uh, addressing these concerns is part of our next steps. We have uh, essentially uh, received over 35 uh, submissions for the, the new museum design that some of the world's best architects have submitted for, for the plants, some local, and um, we we're really excited about that. Along with that RFQ, we put out an RFP to study these buildings, to provide that information to, to the, the architect that would be selected to apply that and, and make sure that that information is, is, is uh, available to, to the design team that will be tackling the, the, the museum for the Alamo. And we're really excited about that. And this is, this is exactly what we think is best in terms of how we move forward in a thoughtful process. The next is to relocate the cenotaph within the Alamo Plaza. Um, of course, uh, originally we had the cenotaph located uh, much further away, uh, off by uh, the uh, funeral pyre off of Market Street. And uh, we have, we have, that's one of the changes. We actually brought it back to the Alamo Plaza. It's within about 500 feet. Of, of where it currently sits now. And, and we're doing this because, again, we're trying to recapture the footprint and, and the cenotaph where it sits now is currently uh, in the middle of that mission footprint. And so we'll, what we hope to do is get it to, to 500 feet to the south. We're still tweaking some of that location and as we've discussed, there's gonna be more work to be done on how that is incorporated to Alamo Plaza. If you can go to the next slide. But you can see that what we've done is we did a rendering to show uh, the cenotaph on the existing site. Uh, if we uh, if we have if we leave the cenotaph where it is, and you have the uh, mission footprint lowered, it, it's it really is a little out of place. And you can go to the next slide. So part of part of the idea is to create a, a mission footprint that that is period neutral, allows the museum to to uh, have exhibits, uh, have classes out there. Uh, and demonstrate what is what is specific to to the Mission San Antonio de Valero, otherwise known as the Alamo, and that is critical to how we want to change the experience <clears throat> the experience at the Alamo, because that's at the heart of our entire uh, goal and vision and guiding principles moving this forward. Go to the next slide. As you can see, when you look at uh, from an aerial shot, uh, the current cenotaph location in the middle of, of the mission footprint would be relocated about where the, uh, the current bandstand is. And ironically, we found out that uh, that was the original location proposed for the cenotaph. And, uh, and so now we're, we're moving it into a general location that, that is in line with the original suggested location for the cenotaph. And we, we think that there's lots of opportunity to discuss how we, how we accomplish a, a, a cenotaph that now is part of uh, a master plan design. As you can see here, 
this is this is what it would look like within an expanded Alamo Plaza in a, in a prominent location. Of course, lots more to tweak out, but the point is, is that it is part of an overall plan or overall scheme where it doesn't really, it's not really a part of a scheme now. And so that is what we, we hope to, to accomplish with the relocation of the cenotaph. And go to the next one. And of course, we also want to encourage a formal entry point uh, at the site. Once again, we're simply trying to, to elevate that experience, change the experience at the Alamo. Most people, when they arrive to the Alamo, are not uh, aware of where they need to go. Many people wander around. And, and this, is, this is troubling because that orientation is, is, is critical. That orientation is part of, of how somebody uh, is educated about the site itself. And believe it or not, is part of the original uh, uh, language from 2014 in the Citizens Advisory Committee's vision and guiding principles. We want to change, we want to orient people before they arrive to the compound itself really give them that opportunity to understand what they're walking on. Most people arrive and they don't necessarily understand that they're on the mission footprint itself. And, uh, and so we, we also heard that, we also listened that the site needed to remain open 24 seven. And so uh, while we're creating a formal point of entry, there is public access 24 seven. It's free of charge. Uh, we do encourage that uh, people who come into the, the plaza will be coming in through an entry point that can help that orientation. We did add, as you can see, this is the current situation here where uh, most people, when they, they come in, they, they walk towards uh, a little stand, I call it a little hot dog stand, um, that, that orients people, uh, and then they will maybe walk to the front of the church, and that's about it, and they, they try to figure out how they get around the Alamo. Um, what we're trying to propose is, is something a, a little more comprehensive. As you can see, this is a site uh, that includes a primary entrance and, and, and orientation to ensure that the people understand where, they, where they're standing and understand that, that this is a, a unique site. You can go to the next slide. We've also added some uh, additional access points depending on, uh, uh, upon the programming on the site in the lease agreement there are some specific dates that those additional points will be open uh, during museum hours. And of course, this is only during museum hours, and that, that's, that's critical to point out. But as, as you can see, there's always north-south access. And then this slide shows the museum uh, during non-museum hours access. So the site is, is very porous, very open, and allows people to, to uh, go in and out of the, the plaza as needed. And that is, that is uh, really important because we know that uh, again this part of the evolution of this plan has been to understand that this is a, a public space it's a civic space uh, but this civic space has also grown it is it is a much bigger uh, experience and with that again we're simply saying we want to make room for the stories at the alamo and so when people come and visit whether it's during museum hours or non-museum hours, they are understanding the ground they're, they're walking on. And that is, that is critical to, to this, this uh, aspect of, of the project because uh, we're trying to recapture that, that original mission footprint. You go to the next slide. And so we're gonna talk now about the streets and vehicular traffic, and I'll call up uh, Mr. Gene Dawson to talk a little bit about, about the closure of the streets to vehicular traffic. Okay, Gene Dawson, Craig Dawson Engineers. Thank you, Councilman. I uh, do have some trouble with the speed here. Okay, so uh, we have been looking at the traffic, and it's important to point out that uh, this traffic and this presentation evolved out of a 2012 transportation study for downtown that we did for the city of San Antonio. This study wasn't created for the Alamo. What the 2012 study, the intent of the study was, is to look at the entire downtown grid and determine what would happen with the bond issues with a lot of the projects that are coming forward downtown. Uh, as you know, we have uh, uh, a lot of bond projects, we have a lot of complete streets, 
Uh, we have a lot of hotels under construction. And so the purpose of this uh, downtown transportation study is to uh, give the city a tool to say, if uh, the Hilton Canopy Hotel wants to shut off uh, St. Mary Street, what happens to the grid? Where, where does all the traffic go? And that's what this uh, downtown transportation study does. Then in 2017, as this plan uh, developed, the city said, uh, drop in the closure of Alamo Street, the closure of Houston Street, and tell us what the uh, solutions are and the impacts. And so that's what you'll see here in this study. This is just a graphic showing the same kind of linear uh, discussion that I just went through there. We have a downtown transportation study. It's a tool to look at everything that can happen downtown and then the solutions that can come forward. Uh, this is a screenshot of the downtown model that we have, and I'll refer to this, and we can come back to it later. I have a little graphic, but we have modeled every intersection downtown. Uh, when we model it, then we can come back in and put a new project in, increase the traffic, uh, do what we need for the city to evaluate what's happening downtown. First thing we did in this study was look at the adjoining highways, and you can see that we're already to capacity. Uh, this, in fact, was in uh, 2000. 12, our peak hour at 5.30 p.m., uh, we're already at to 100% capacity. So uh, the other thing we did in 2012 is we predicted a traffic growth, and we predicted very high traffic growth, uh, at almost 5%. And the city in 2017 asked us to go back and check our assumptions. In fact, what we found was the growth rate was about half of what we anticipated in 2012. You know, traffic, even if you have a lot going on, it just takes a long time for traffic uh, to grow. What you do have here in this kind of bubble diagram, we did have 4.2% traffic growth uh, in yes, the uh, North River area, the Pearl area, about 2.3% in the core, not a lot of traffic changing there, and then in South Town about 3%, uh, which you would expect. So with our highways clogged on still over the next 20, 30 years, we're going to depend a lot on our arterials coming into downtown, like Broadway and St. Mary's and Houston and Cesar Chavez. Uh, so that's what this map is here. And based on the green that you see, we have a lot of capacity in those arterials. And we're just using a graphic here of the new frost tower that's under construction. Uh, that frost tower is the equivalent of six Hilton Canopy hotels, and we have the capacity for 15 more frost towers or 90 more hotels. As another example, uh, that frost tower has the equivalent of 1,300 apartment units, and we have the, uh, therefore the capacity for about 20,000 more apartments downtown. So we have a lot of arterial capacity to feed the downtown grid. And then we project that 3% growth out for 10 years and get us to 2027, and we eat up about 25% of our capacity. And then we go another 10 years out, so 20 years out from today, and we would have eaten about 55% of our capacity. So even 20 years from now, we will still have arterial capacity leading into downtown. So then let's focus more in on the area that uh, we're talking about closing of Alamo Street in particular. Uh, this graphic here shows uh, the uh, street grid between Commerce and Travis. And the blue lines are your northbound lanes and the red lines are your southbound lane. And the numbers in the yellow boxes show you the capacity. And then it, at the end of each of those arrows, you have a number. Uh, the bottom line is, is we have about 2,700 peak hour traffic southbound capacity and we have 1,800 now. So uh, just under half, we're only using half of our northbound, uh, our southbound capacity. And then on the northbound, we have 2,400 vehicle peak hour trip capacity in this grid through here that goes from Navarro all the way over to Bowie. And uh, we only really today have about 1,200 uh, trips today. So we have a lot of capacity still in these streets. And as you guys know, when you close down a street, uh, which we do all the time downtown without a long process just for construction, it's a grid. So you find the next street over or the third street over. And uh, so at the end of the 2017 planning process, the idea was is just to let traffic find its way. Uh, in other words, not do anything, no new construction, and uh, let traffic use this excess capacity. Uh, if you're down in Southtown, don't come up South Alamo, come up St. Mary's to Navarro, that kind of a thing. Going east-west, if you're trying to come from uh, uh, 37 along Houston Street, you already know it's already at dead ends and you have to go around and come back in and do a 
kind of a crazy left and a right and another right. And so uh, that would not change with the closing of Houston Street. And what we found in the eastbound uh, uh, direction, what people are trying to do on Houston Street is get over 237 and get up there to McCullough and get on and head north. And the reality is uh, that best movement is to go up Broadway and across McCullough. In fact, we ought to sign that today. It's just, it's just much more efficient. And there's very little traffic. You can see you only have 40, 70 peak hour trips. Uh, and in fact, uh, Alamo, if you're on Alamo, in front of the Alamo now, there's not a dedicated north lane there. You have to sit behind a left turn lane or a right turn lane. Very few cars going north on Alamo. So now we can take our... The one thing in closing Houston, what it does for us is the worst intersection downtown, <laughs> besides Santa Rosa and Cesar Chavez, if you drive through there, is the Broadway Houston La Soya intersection today. It is a D intersection. This exhibit on the left shows you that it's a D intersection right there in the middle. When you close Houston Street, it becomes a C intersection and then gives you the opportunity to find other solutions for North uh, South traffic. So what we decided to look at was to convert La Soya between uh, Houston Street and Commerce to two-way, and, and the rest of this presentation will take a look at what happens there. So uh, that's what we're looking at just right in this section, because South Alamo, south of Commerce is two-way, Broadway, north of Houston is two-way. Is there a way to make La Soya two-way? This is a, uh, what I'll call a horrible graphic, but it does show um, two southbound lanes on the soy and one northbound lane. So today, what you have on the soy is you really have two southbound uh, lanes at 11 foot wide and seven foot, there's three seven foot loading areas, short loading areas that make up a 36 foot of pavement. And what we're proposing then is to go to 36 foot of pavement with 12 foot lanes, uh, one northbound and two southbound. I want to emphasize that the southbound lanes, the right hand lane, will be designated for loading during specific times. And in fact, our linear feet of loading will actually increase along La Soya. And uh, as you might uh, have been told before, we are working with the downtown vendors and suppliers uh, to find adequate solutions. So now if you're going northbound, you have to cut through Alamo Plaza and then cut back over to Broadway. You can see that on the left. And the option that uh, we're currently proposing is we would make it one long uh, north-south uh, connectivity. So I'm going to look in, at two specific intersections. Again, I already talked about the Broadway, Houston Street, La Soya intersection, and then what we call the Torch intersection. So right now, the Broadway Houston La Soya intersection is a D intersection. You can see the blue lines are conflicting with people doing right and left on uh, off of Houston Street, and then you're having the whole Broadway, and then you can't take a right hand from Broadway onto Houston. And you, the picture there pretty much shows how it is. However, if we close Houston Street, we no longer have that movement and we have a continual right-hand turn lane off of Broadway on the Houston Street. It enabled, uh, enables us to have a C intersection, a continual uh, turn uh, northbound off of Houston Street. So you can see just visually and instinctively, this is gonna be a much better intersection with the closing of Houston Street. Down here at the Torch intersection, uh, you, I'm sure everybody in town has driven through that. It's actually three intersections all gobbled together in one. Creates a very uh, complicated uh, signal timing uh, for the city of San Antonio. And uh, it takes a lot of delay time to get through this intersection. And what is proposed is we will take that down to just two intersections instead of three. And uh, you can imagine then how much more traffic time we can get to those intersections. I want to emphasize that the uh, the connection between market and commerce still remains two-way like it is. And uh, you can see that now we also control pedestrians a lot better through this area. And because we've taken out a whole intersection, we've got some minutes that we can give to pedestrians. And if you drive on the Soya, one of the bigger problems isn't cars, it's people walking everywhere because there's not a continual pedestrian path on the south side of commerce. You can't get to the torch. So you can see in the diagram here, people are crossing uh, commerce, coming back down, crossing again. There's people all over this intersection. And uh, then in the lower right, you can see with the closing and aligning with La Soya, 
we can then uh, make a continual pedestrian path along the south side of Commerce, make it a lot less complicated, get people out of the street, and again, give more traffic time to the La Soya Commerce intersection. Okay, so I, I showed you that screenshot earlier of every intersection in town. And so this is what, you can click on any section in this model. This, we're starting out at Market and uh, in South Alamo. Uh, these are peak hour trips and you can see uh, what the traffic will do. The model here is built with the two-way on the soil. Uh, if you look closely, you can see that uh, when we hold pedestrians and when they go so they don't conflict uh, with the, uh, the traffic. And now because we have the extra time, we can give that time to the pedestrians, then we can stop them, we can make free rights. It's always so frustrating when you're trying to turn right and you're waiting minutes and minutes for pedestrians to get out of the way. You can see the pedestrians going down the mile. Now we'll, we'll fly over and we'll go up to La Soya. So we're flying over Commerce and uh, the La Soya intersection now. You, this is the first time you see the northbound cars uh, on La Soya. You've got the southbound lanes clearing. No pedestrians to conflict with that right-hand movement there. And I want to emphasize, so on any intersection downtown, and we can come in and we have dropped in like all the hemisphere development, any new uh, hotel development. Uh, so the city has this tool uh, that they can use on any type of traffic growth. Now this is the uh, Broadway Houston La Soya intersection. You can see we don't have on the right side the Houston Street coming uh, from the east. And these are real traffic, peak hour traffic counts. So when you see an intersection clearing, that's what it will look like uh, in the future. So this uh, particular model, this is pretty much straight engineering uh, uh, traffic model. But I have one more video here that we'll see. Uh, we'll go ahead and go to the next one. Uh, this is a little more graphic for the uh, 3D, just to give you another idea. Here we're coming through the, the market intersection again going by the torch. You can see now that the torch is on the right hand side there. It's within a plaza area. Uh, you can approach up to it. You can see the crossings. You can see the backup on the soil, very similar to what you would see today in a peak hour. And then we fly up uh, the soil. So, and the, the point of these are to show, uh, just give a layman's uh, presentation of the traffic, the detail that's gone into this, the possibilities in reacting to the closure of uh, uh, Alamo Street and uh, Houston Street. And uh, we really think there's some opportunity to improve uh, some of the bad intersections in town, including improving some of the delivery systems. So and I'll just go ahead now and, and end this. And uh, I guess I'm going to hand it off to John. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is John Kasman. I'm from PGAV Destinations. Lori had spoke a little bit about the interpretive plan team that's made up of PGAV Cultural Innovations and Reed Hildebrand. Uh, Eric Kramer with Reed Hildebrand is here. He's going to speak a little bit uh, after me about the Alamo plan and the site strategies and some of the creative content that's behind it. We wanted to pause a little bit and we've already talked a lot about the detail. Right? We talked about process and traffic and all kinds of, of detail behind the plan. We wanted to take a moment to step back and, and share with you some of the why and, and some of the statement about the opportunity that we have in front of us and what has driven us as an interpretive plan team. I, Part of that is we, we realize that the goals that have been given to us from the master plan and the vision and guiding principles are bold and they're visionary and they are um, one of great opportunity. And so with that, we, we started to think about um, when you put that into one sentence, you, you think about imagining a world-class historic site that tells the whole story of the Alamo. And what that also means is creating an experience for anybody who comes there that is worthy 
of the Alamo as one of the greatest historic sites that we have in the nation and, and in the world. And when we think of that type of experience, we have to step back and think about what is, when we use the term world class, what does that mean? And so as a team, we had to think about that. And we, we wanted to share with you that to us that means that it's an experience that has to do with inspiration and one of an emotional connection. It also means that we're dealing with experiences that have to do with authenticity. And we, we are creating an experience that is, can only happen here in the Alamo, can only happen here in your great city of San Antonio. It's one of greater understanding, so that anybody who comes here, whether it's a local or a visitor, understands the greater story of what's going on here. It's also one of reverence. Access and inclusion are a big part of that as well, as well as commemoration and celebration for the city and for the Alamo and all the great stories and the layers of history behind this project. So it's a very comprehensive project, and it's one that all those thoughts have been ones that have been driven uh, for our design team when we think about the goals that are in front of us. And we know that the Alamo it is the heart of your civic life here in the city. And we also know that the experience as it is now is a bit compromised. And when you think of it as an urban plaza and as a historic site, there's a little bit of compromise on both of those existing conditions today. We know that right now in the experience it is does have some distractions. It also has threatened to the sensitive structures and the ability to understand all of those hidden stories are there are compromised because of the existing conditions that are there. At the same time, that existing plaza as it is, curbs and planters start to limit its capacity to be as great of a civic space as what is expressed within the vision and guiding principles. So as we think about those things, those, the details that Eric will go through now we are talking about a transformational experience, and we take that to heart, but we also believe that in creating the Civic Plaza experience as well as a powerful cultural destination is not an either or. We feel that this plan that, we're, that we have presenting to you today is, a, is an and situation and not an either or. So with that, Eric's gonna come up and expand on that and share with you some design strategies and site strategies and also some, uh, some content behind it. Uh, behind the site work. Eric Kramer from Reed Hildebrand. We're landscape architects. So when we approach this question of how you achieve these goals, we think about what are the physical conditions in place? What are the characteristics of the physical experience of your city that enable these things to happen? And as urbanists, we think about how those things, those landscapes, those physical conditions give back to the city as a whole, how they elevate the experience of being within a city, not about how they disconnect you from your experience of the city. We also think about our users, and here this um, sort of statement suggests two different groups of users that have to be accommodated, and we believe that the plan really does. The day-to-day -day citizens of San Antonio treat this like a center square within a vibrant urban part of the city, and the visitors that are coming from far and wide to experience the history and the cultural significance of the Alamo. As John suggested today, we recognize that actually on what is quite a tight space, we have two overlapping and sometimes conflicting conditions. The desire to tell all the stories to create an, old, an outdoor museum experience and to create a vibrant urban center, a plaza. What this plan envisions is having both of those things and understanding that the two of them really are in positive relationship with each other, not negative. That the historic site, the actual delineation of the footprint of the mission and the church and the long barrack and the, and the 1936 garden are surrounded by a vibrant urban plaza. And that is the space that is occupied and daily used by visitors and the everyday citizens of San Antonio alike. What we see here today is the recognition that much of that history is under our streets, under existing buildings, within the plaza, and not accessible, not legible, not understandable. There is much to be uncovered and told. When we look at the condition today, we see that what we think of as the historic site the church and the long barrack and the garden, the convento walls, 
is really just over four acres. And the usable portion of Alamo Plaza, really what's surrounded by streets, is just over an acre. The opportunity here is to expand the mission footprint to show, to reveal as much of it as possible, and to create a historic site that's almost seven acres in scale, to create a location for that museum and visitor center that orients visitors, that explains the history, and doesn't just tell the, the story of those 13 days, but of the full 300 years of the site. And all of that really embedded in and engaged in a larger, more expansive plaza that creates a pedestrian zone that reaches all the way down to commerce, that reaches out to La Soya, and that even creates the opportunities for this mission to be understood all the way up to the North Mall, where you can't even understand that the mission uh, existed because you're on the street between the Gibbs Hotel and the Federal Building. So this is what that might look like. Imagine where Crockett Street is today, that whole area to the south reaching down to the torch and to commerce is a pedestrianized space and vibrant urban plaza surrounded by ground floor full of activity and commerce. And then to the north of that really is the historic site, the church and the garden uh, and the visitor center and museum, all of which are held together by this kind of transformed quality and experience. That urban plaza is shaded. It is a place where we really envision people want to stay, they want to um, be. It is a kind of a living room for the city. At the center of it is the cenotaph, as Councilman Trevino uh, described, as a really ceremonial entry and welcome to the historic experience to the north. Within the footprint, again, a transformed experience where history and everyday life come together where you're brought really into close focus with the church and the long barrack in a way you couldn't before. Throughout that area, 300 years of history will be told. We describe that as the mission period, the battle of the Alamo period, and indeed what happened in the years up until even today. And those stories are stories of multiple communities that have activated and animated and lived in this site and it's really a broad retelling of the stories of the Alamo. How does that work when you're down on the ground? Well, here's that image you saw again. Today, you'd be standing in the middle of Alamo Street, and this is now understood to understand yourself as standing in the middle of the mission. You would see the long barracks, you would see a portal bringing you into the convento. Um, there would be opportunities for living history and performance and school groups, because now a shaded plaza enables people to pause and stay there and actually learn. Here, the north-south promenade along the west side, again, open 24-7. But here, looking into the site, you would see the edge of the west, um, the buildings that were along the western edge. Here, uh, where Travis penned his famous letter. Um, again, living history performances and even the opportunity to put, bring water back to the site and re-express uh, the acequia. Here, looking north, again, effectively at the intersection of Houston and Alamo, um, seeing the north wall where uh, Travis fell and having an opportunity uh, that you cannot have today to actually have access to that. And then this is also an area where we know there are significant burials. We know those people's names, we know their stories, Here's an opportunity to actually reveal them, to commemorate them, and to even have um, activities and ceremonies that uh, uh, recognize uh, their uh, sacrifices and their uh, role in the history of this site. And finally, imagine yourself um, on La Soya Street, looking into the site from uh, your back is effectively to the Hyatt. Here, you're in a kind of garden-like entry but in front of you, you see the 18-pounder and the Lasoya house, and you see actively here interpreted the multiple periods of history that animated this site, um, the Palisade, uh, and of course, the South Gate and the Lunette being brought into some kind of expression, so that even without entering the footprint, you are brought, that is brought into close uh, uh, association with everybody who walks through the site. 
We'd like to talk about this project as a series of compromises between the many different points of view and the many different ideas. But at the end of the day, we don't believe it's a compromised project. It's a project that brings all of those stories together in an incredibly powerful way, where you can experience the living history, you can explore the mission, you can trace your personal historical roots on the site, you can understand the diverse perspectives, you can honor those lives, and ideally you can even see excavations and archaeology in practice. The living site, and we believe that putting these all together, you create, again, both the best, the best of both worlds, a vibrant urban core, and an amazing historic experience. Thank you, Eric. And so now I'll talk a little bit about the status and next steps. Of course, I didn't realize that I could control it from right here, so thank you for your assistance uh -huh. earlier. I'm using that on this side. Uh, so, you know, August 30th, the Alabama Citizens Advisory Committee uh, approved uh, this, this portion of, of the project. Of course, uh, the Management Committee met next on September 4th, and uh, we got approval, of course, and the, uh, October 2nd, the Alamo Executive Committee made up of the uh, Mayor of San Antonio and the General Land Office Commissioner uh, signed the resolution to, to move this forward. So what's next is, is obviously we're here today with the Planning Commission and HDRC and uh, we're looking for approval. Uh, the Planning Commission recommendation to City Council is required to close sections of Alamo Street, Houston Street, and Crockett Streets to vehicular access and create a pedestrian only right of way and to close, vacate, and abandon right of way on Alamo and Houston Street necessary to recapture the historic plaza. Additionally, the Planning Commission must make a recommendation to the City Council regarding the proposed lease between the City and the General Land Office for the City owned property necessary to recapture the historic Alamo Plaza. The Historic Design Review. Uh, must review the proposed design changes to the Alamo Plaza and make recommendations to City Council. The proposed design changes include but are not limited to the relocation of the Cenotaph, the, the establishment of a formal point of entry to the plaza during museum hours, and the rerouting of the two Fiesta parades in a manner that still accommodates important Fiesta traditions to include the floral tribute. Uh, the Office of Historic Preservation must also review and approve the relocation and repair plan for the Cenotaph prior to any work beginning. Uh, while the HGRC does not have purview over the historic buildings owned by the state of Texas, HGRC will review and provide comments on the recommendations to THC. City, the City of San Antonio City Council must consider the closure of the sections of Alamo Street, Houston Street, and Crockett Street to uh, vehicles in order to create a pedestrian only right away and the abandonment of the right-of-way on Alamo Houston Street necessary to recapture the historic plaza. City Council must also consider the lease and operating agreement with the General Land Office, the authorization to negotiate and execute a contract or contracts for the restoration and relocation of the cemetery. The Texas Historical Commission must review and approve the relocation of the cenotaph and propose plans for the historic buildings owned by the state of Texas. While the HDRC does not have purview over the historic buildings owned by the state of Texas, HDRC will review and provide comments and recommendations to THC. So the city will be asked to take action on a lease agreement with the General Land Office for the management of the historic footprint. The proposed lease agreement is 50 years with two 25-year extensions. The GLO will ensure that the plaza area shall remain open, accessible, and free of charge to the public. It will ensure that the public may enter the Alamo Complex, the church, the new museum, and the outdoor historic mission footprint through a main entry when the museum is open. It will open two additional access exit points during the museum operating hours if there is no museum programming scheduled for the historic mission footprint or during times of high pedestrian activity. It will provide high quality programming and services that enhances the historic and cultural significance of the site. It will comply with all applicable local, state, and federal laws, Texas Health and Safety Code, State Antiquities Code, 
to also ensure the design for the planned museum within the current footprint of the Crockett, the Old Palace, and Woolworth buildings is reviewed by HDRC and approved by THC. It will also ensure the Alamo plan recognizes and interprets the historic significance of the Woolworth building in the civil rights movement. The city of San Antonio will develop a service and delivery plan to accommodate the area businesses and service providers that are impacted by the street closure. The city and the GLO will work with the Battle of Flowers, Fiesta Flambeau, Fiesta Commission, and Cavaliers on rerouting the parades in order to accommodate the more the important Fiesta traditions like the full tributes. As you can see, here is a map to show you the lease agreement with the general land office. You, you should be provided that information at your desk. Before we conclude the presentation, I want to remind everyone that the project is partially funded. The city adopted fiscal year 2016 capital budget, including 17 million for the redevelopment of the Alamo Plaza and surrounding area. Additionally, the 2017 bond included includes approximately 21 million for the construction of facilities in support of the Alamo area improvements and street improvements. The Texas legislature approved 31.5 million in 2015 and 75 million in 2017 for the restoration of the Alamo and redevelopment of surrounding area. The Alamo Endowment is committed to raising approximately $200 million for implementation. And these funding commitments along with the Texas legislature and Alamo Endowment contributions will allow for immediate implementation of certain components of the master plan. And at this point, that concludes our presentation and we're here available for any questions. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Appreciate the presentation. Um, it's very, very beneficial, very thorough. Thank you. Um, now we will move on to Citizens to be Heard, which will be called by the uh, DSP administrator. All right, first person I have signed in to speak is Patty Science. Is Don Dixon and Patricia Seidenberger here? Okay, so you have a total of nine minutes, Patty. Good afternoon, Commissioners. My name is Patty Zions. I'm the first Vice President of San Antonio Conservation Society, speaking on behalf, of, on behalf of our organization, and I do believe you have a copy of this particular statement before you. Over the summer, the San Antonio Conservation Society collected some 7,500 signatures to maintain Alamo Plaza as a public place and preserve its historic structures. We are concerned that the terms of the lease agreement will severely curtail public access to the plaza. In addition to our concern, in addition to our concern for the landmark Crockett, Palace, and Woolworth buildings, we feel that the lease will severely limit the San Antonio's, City of San Antonio's ability to direct the future of one of its most important public spaces. Since 2015, the Conservation Society has urged the incorporation of three historic buildings into the new Alamo Museum. The 2017 Alamo Master Plan called for the same, and our organization largely supported that plan. <coughs> The current plan is less clear about the buildings, the historic buildings future. Despite the support for preservation voiced by Mayor Ron Nierenberg, Councilman Roberto Trevino, and City Manager Cheryl Scully. Equally concerning are the lease terms, which will require all Alamo visitors to pass through a single entrance during business hours. The area will cease to function as a plaza and become a themed cul-de-sac. Special events will further limit public access, even though the 1871 conveyance of the plaza included a condition that, and I quote, 
The property hereby conveyed is conveyed on condition that it shall be dedicated to the public use as an open space and be made a part and of one with public plaza above and below it now known as Alamo Plaza and Plaza de Valero, end quote. The current interpretive plan has focused almost exclusively on the first half of the Alamo's 300 year history with extensive discussion and design regarding the mission period, the 1836 battle, and the decades following that battle. There's been very little discussion of its important late 19th and 20th century history as a public plaza, including the notable voluntary and peaceful desegregation of lunch counters, exemplified at Woolworths on March the 16th, 1960. This lease agreement negates almost every aspect of local authority the city has historically exercised over this vital area of downtown. The lease needs to be amended to give the city more control over the results of the plan. Thank you for considering our remarks. Next person I have is Susan Bevan. Is Charlie Hansen here? <coughs> okay, so you have six minutes. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Susan Bevan, 19807 Sweet Road, Hellotus, Texas. As Patty mentioned, over the summer, the San Antonio Conservation Society collected some 7,500 signatures to maintain Alamo Plaza as a public place and preserve its historic structures. Since 2015, we have urged the incorporation of these three historic buildings into the new Alamo Museum. We have been encouraged that Mayor Ron Nirenberg, Councilman Roberto Trevino, and City Manager Cheryl Scully also have called for their preservation as outlined in the 2017 Alamo Master Plan. The 1882 Crockett Block, 1923 Palace Theater, and the 1921 Woolworth Building received city landmark designation in 1978 and have been listed on the National Register of Historic Places as contributing buildings in the Alamo Plaza Historic District since 1977. The building's historic and architectural merit have long been acknowledged by San Antonio's City Council and the National Park Service. The San Antonio chapter of the American Institute of Architects and the National Trust for Historic Preservation have urged the building's reuse based on their significance. The plan today calls for an analysis of the building's significance and reuse potential. Unfortunately, the description of this process is biased in favor of demolition. One page criticizes the structural configurations of all three buildings although only the palace floors are out of alignment and the altered interiors of the 1920s buildings allows for new museum space behind their existing facades. Alfred Giles, the city's premier architect, designed the Crockett Block, which appears alone in some of the renderings for the future Alamo Museum. However, the Woolworth Building's position on Alamo Plaza made it the most important site where the first voluntary and peaceful desegregation of southern lunch counters occurred on March 16, 1960. Three days later, Jackie Robinson compared San Antonio's decision to integrate its lunch counters with his own entry into Major League Baseball. The demolition of this building would continue the marginalization of sites with historic ties to African American experience. Reusing these historic buildings not only preserves the plaza's authenticity, it avoids the mistake of trading real historic fabric for a conjectural reconstruction or incompatible new construction. These buildings can be reverent and contribute to a world-class museum. 
the Louvre in Orsay in Paris, the Uffizi in Florence, and our own McNay, Witte, and San Antonio Museum of Art all are in repurposed buildings. Thank you for your consideration. John Dixon. <coughs> Thank you, committee. My name is Don Dixon. I've been a business person here in San Antonio about 50 years, and I'm kind of speaking for my wife. She was a daughter, and she volunteered for, uh, she was a out of missions chapter, and she had the privilege of serving on that committee that ran the Alamo for about six years. Now, what I want to talk to you about is the drastic changes that we're talking about in the Alamo. Looking back at that 110 year history, where these ladies took over the Alamo build it up from nothing, all volunteer, and they guarded that shrine of Texas with their hearts and with their service. Now there's many historical issues that you're going to be dealing with here that I believe are negative, and you're going to be dealing with planning issues which I believe are negative. This plan is sort of a dusted off plan from 1994. Some changes, but the basics are still there from 94. Closing the streets, altering the use of the plastics, moving the cemetery. The daughters got wind of this. They hired an attorney, Sam Dibberl, pleaded their case. The main things that they were interested in is in this document. I hope they, I hope they gave these to, I gave them to the staff yesterday, is that they guarded access and visibility as imperative in protecting the Alamo. And that is true today. If you close the streets, you're not only closing off mobility in the city of San Antonio, but you're closing off visibility and access for Texas's greatest tourist attraction. There's many, many problems. They've already mentioned the deed, and, here, and here's the deed. You have a copy with that. You copy that. The plaza, an open public plaza, is an open space as it is seconds. for 147 <coughs> years. Keep it open. Keep the streets open. Do not move the cenotaph. Leave it where it is, never designed to be moved. Leave those historic buildings to the, to the west. Do not disturb those buildings. You have a chance. This committee has a chance to protect our greatest, one of our greatest assets in Texas. Hold down this plan. Do not pass it up. Pacocha India First Nation, Indian descendants from the Alamo. Can you pass the notice? And we have, uh, we, come as, we are grouped, we are tribe, Indian descendants, so we have elder province. And then we have also our Taipu, the Tribal Historic Preservation Office that has represented many tribes, uh, Mr. Randy Lee Barnes, and he will get time from Brett Smith. And we just want to clarify that before um, we give you the notice of cease and disease. That everybody also got the letter that we sent on September the 21st to the Secretary of the Interior and the National Park Service Director, Paul Smith, that everybody got this letter. You got the letter, all of you? Man, your time has started. Okay. 
So again, you know, we just giving you, uh, can you put this one in the, in the screen so they can see it? Put it in the screen. Again, we already coming back and say it many times. We giving you notice of the seas and disease to enjoying this product called, the project is called Alamo, Reimage Alamo Master Plan. There's no proof along Houston Street that there's burial grounds. Alamo Street needs to keep open. Okay, there's no burial grounds there. It was already des destroyed. And any bones that they found there during putting uh, water lines, electrical lines, they took those bones from my ancestors and throw, they throw them to the garbage. Okay, so again, we're telling you, you need to stop ceasing disease. This is already, already a lawsuit. Okay, the cenotaph was built by federal monies and an agreement and a contract, and you have that ordinance, OH 197. It says clearly there that the city will do all due diligence to preserve it and maintain it. They have not. It is a shame. And the federal government, when they build a national monument or build a federal building, is to stay. 30 seconds. Okay? So again, we are asking you right now, we're just giving you notice to cease and disease. Otherwise, this is no difference than the apple white. Okay? We're going to stop the project. And again, the plaza has to be open. It's under or Native American religion. Uh, you know, and again, you have not honored NAPRA. You're in violation of NAPRA. This is a huge issue here. You have not consulted with us under NAPRA. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Next person I have is Sophia Torres. Well, I'm not. Uh, uh, I'm actually going to give my time. What's your name, ma'am? It's Sophia Torres. Are you Sophia Torres? Yes. She is? Yes, I'm Sophia Torres. Okay, all right, okay. so you get three more minutes. So again, we're going back to square one. NAPRA. I'm giving you again notice. And you need to cease in disease. Because you didn't open NAPRA. Because me as an Indian descendant, Paco Chen, and our people that are still in existence, we have the bloodline, we have the DNA to prove it. Yes, we are Indians, and we're Paco Chen. And we came from San Juan Bautista, the mother of all missions, and slavery. And the people died, horrible deaths there in Alamo Plaza. Alamo Plaza is the church, it's not the chapel. That's where the doctrina was done. So again, I'm telling you, this is ceased and deceased. It happened in Apple White. And it was shot, a multi-billion dollar project in 1992 after Nayapra passed in 1990. You have the Sonoras. You disrespect us. And I'm saying this to the present council and city manager. We see them on the 80. And how many times you have seen me here, Ms. Guadalajara, with Concepcion? You approve on top of an Indian cemetery by letting in disregarding Nayapra to build multi-use apartments in Concepcion Mission. And you did it then also, David Allman, to build a huge building on top of the Madre Acequia where my ancestors, Eddie Piame, Tilly Hayas, Sanas, built that Madre Acequia with blood and tears in Hemisphere. And I sue you. Chief Davis is sending you a message. He spent $80,000 of his money, and we sue the city. That also was this meat without prejudice. It means that we can bring it back. But we're suing you. The Alamo of the Furniture are suing you. The cenotaph is not going to be moved, not even half an inch. I'm not saying an inch, half an inch. It is no difference that the battle of the little horn, you don't see fences, you don't see rails, you don't see obstruction. That's freedom. That is what Alamo Plaza means to all of us. And the streets have to be open, okay? If I'm missing anything else, we already rejected. Do not enjoy. Do not move forward. This is Apple White. This is like Apple White. 30 seconds. Thank you. 
is of 30 more seconds. So again, where's Niagara? When are you gonna consult with us? It's too late. How many times we came here and talked to you in all these public meetings, way back since 2012? We do recall the first meeting at the public library with the PPS, people that came from New York, and we already said it, don't do it. You need to consult with us. They never consult with us. That's three minutes. And again, it's not, it's not even a warning. Thank it's you not saying cease and desist. Next person I have is Lee Spencer White. Lee Spencer White, president of the Alamo Descendants Association. We represent uh, the defenders, the scouts, the couriers. Um, we have over 13,000 people have signed a petition saying don't move the Senate Act. We've had two professional surveys done, one in the city, which was with Councilman Perry, over 63% of the citizens of San Antonio say don't move the Senate Act. We had a statewide survey, professional, um, across the state. Each county in Texas was um, included in the survey, and we had 60% of Texans saying, don't move the Senate tax. And I would like, just for a point of correction here, um, never ever has the Senate tax, even in the early design phases in the 30s, ever was going to be placed outside the fort. Um, Councilman Trevino is very, very wrong in saying that bandstand is where they were gonna put it. That bandstand was put there in the 1980s. And again, never ever was there any consideration of it being outside the fort. That's what our issue is. Prepare it where it sits. Yes, it sits in the heart of the Alamo. It should sit in the heart of the Alamo. The blood's there. It's an insult to move them out in front of the Minger where we have pub runs, um, you know, uh, street preachers, all the nastiness that people talk about. Hey, they're just moving it over. And they're taking the actual memorial, who everyone's saying, we want this to be sacred ground, but you're throwing the people out who actually did the sacrificing. Is there something wrong here? Yes. Please, repair it where it sits. The survey that was done a couple years ago, the engineer's report, says it's really minor <coughs> repair, needs some more investigation. $200,000, you can fix it where it sits. You wanna take millions and move it and maybe break it? No. Leave it where it sits. That's where the blood is. That's where it needs to be kept in the reverent area. Thank you. <laughs> Next person in here is Randy Barnes. Rhett, I got your time? Yes. Are you Randy Barnes? I am Randy Barnes. Okay. I didn't bring any papers. The city, the state, the federal government has mine. I am a NACRA consultant. NACRA means Native American Graves Protection Repatriation Act, which supersedes all your Texas state laws and antiquities codes. How am I going to put this? You're basing this history on 300 years. Before the Alamo was brought here, when there was two other chapels that were already there, Adobe and a Thatch. And then there was another one at Alizon Creek, which predates what your president complaining about by 100 years. And by that 100 years, there was already tribal people of the Coila nations being buried there. At present, you have 1,738. And that imprint you're talking about is their Camposantos. And some of those lineal descendants are here tonight. Could you please stand up? Ramon Vasquez, Raymond Hernandez. Maria Torres, these are the lineal descendants. Now, your Alamo project falls under NACRO because the Texas Building Commission and George P. Bush accepts federal monies through the congressional appropriated funds, along with the city of San Antonio and the state and county for all national and historical projects. So now it falls in my ballpark. You will not have an open pit your archaeologists, I know, both, I know all the teams, will tell you that under NACRA and under archaeological law, they cannot turn a shovel in the ground unless a federally 
recognized NACPRA officer from the federally recognized nations be here on site, which means you're looking at Mescalero, Comanche, Alabama Cachada, Kickapoo, Kiowa, and plus seven other different nations that I've been on conference with part of my day. I enlisted in the National Registry for National Park Service, U.S. Department of Justice, and United States Department of Defense. And if you need to find me, you can look me up under NACPRO, Randy Barnes, on any of your internet sites. I don't play. I don't play at all. I was involved with the Kerrville projects, Dallas projects, and the projects in Iraq and Afghanistan while I served across the water in my eight tours. I have a 45-page legal document sent in my home right now that was made up by the attorneys to file a federal NACPRO injunction against the city of San Antonio and the Texas General Land Office. It's 45 pages. The last time we used an injunction like this, we closed down the golf course in Universal City. You cannot go forward without this project, without NACPRO. I carry in my pocket a thumb drive that has a history of this area going back to year 1515 through 1899. You guys are talking about a historical footprint. Well, I have Mr. Red uh, right. Smith. Red Smith. Red Smith's time. All right, go ahead, three more okay. minutes. Okay, I have all the fire records. I have all the Castilian records from the College of Quintero, okay? And Sonora de Guadalupe, out of Mexico. I've been doing this for 41 years. I started this when I was 17 years old, when I was a grunt with the uh, out of Samuel Clements High School on summer projects for the University of Texas out of San Antonio when they were putting all the programs together. Y'all need to learn that your Texas Historical Commission cannot protect you under this because NACPA supersedes Texas, Texas historical laws. All you gotta do is call Mark Denton or any of the THC people or Kay Hines who is your chief archeologist or Rob Kistner or your pet project people here and they will tell you NACRA can close this project down in a heartbeat in federal court. It doesn't matter what else anybody else does. The Cenotaph sits on a Camposanto. There are 75 Camposantos within San Antonio city limits. And two of the biggest ones you classify as San Fernando and Valletto. But those ancient burial grounds were already started by the three previous chapels that were already here. And those people are listed as nations. They have no Spanish heritage. They have no French heritage. They are all listed as nations. And one of those nations are the Paiaya nations, and who have family here on a ranch right outside of San Antonio. And I met 50 of the family members who are fairly recognized and were reclassified during the time of Maribel Lamar and David G. Burnett, during the long march to the Red River, and they were reclassified as Kiowa Apache. And they are here in San Antonio today. And they walked out the moment, they were disgusted. Because when you talk about a footprint, the indigenous people of Coahuila nations have the biggest footprint here. That is the heart. Before Texas was Texas, before it was Coahuila Tejas, it was called Coahuila. It's called the land of trees. So the question I have for y'all, you're educated, some of you are lawyers, have master's degrees, bachelor's degrees. Well, I have a degree too, and it's major. It's in archeology span and anthropology from Southern New Hampshire University. My former university was Texas A&M. Thank you. Are you Ramon Vasquez? <coughs> Thank you. Six minutes. Good evening. My name is Raymond Hernandez. I'm a descendant of Francisco Hernandez from 1707. From uh, your grandparents. All right? Going back 12 generations. And Concepcion, 
encarnación pues en Papanak, allá hay India. Uh, I don't know about all these other payayas, but I do definitely do set from them. And in 1995, uh, Roger Kennedy from the Department of Interior came down here because in 1967 they had desecrated our burial grounds. There were the first Catholic Indians at San Juan while I was serving in Vietnam. It took a 32-year struggle to get them back repatriated in 1999. I've personally been involved in over 200 repatriations, personally. I was mentored by Bill Talbot of the Cheyenne, Northern Cheyenne Nation, because at that time we didn't even know how to repatriate someone. Once a person is buried, they're buried forever. And when they're desecrated, I can challenge you all, anyone, y'all don't want to turn around and go back and bury family members. It gets personal. I'm not talking about ancestors. We can all say ancestors a blanket thing, but I got grandparents there at the Alamo, okay? Real grandparents. I'm 12th generation Texan, sixth generation citizen of the United States, because the United States didn't exist here until 1846. So I'm a deep down San Antonio as well as recorded. The Texas Archaeological Department has through DNA established that our people have been here for 10,000 years. Now, that being said, why am I here? I'm here because of Section 106. That's a very important thing. That's one thing that Roger Kennedy told us because back then everybody was saying, you're not federally recognized. Well, under Section 106, it talks about lineal descendants. And those lineal descendants is what helped us get NAGPRA invoked in 1990, of which I was a part of in 1994, to have that installed over there in Oklahoma with all the nations. So what I'm saying is that we need to have this Section 106 involved in this process because if we do not have that into our process, we lose all our voices as Native people. And that's important to us because our history being left to the hands of other people over the last 300 years since our history has existed and because of our contributions have been totally eliminated. Most people don't even realize that we're even still here. They don't even realize the contributions that our families made and had we failed in any of our contributions in the building of these missions, especially the Valero, I said there wouldn't have been a battle of the Alamo. You can assure you that. So there was a lot of other struggles and I'm not here to minimize the battle of contributions of that animal because I had families fight on both sides. Just like I had families fight in the both sides in the Battle of Medina, Battle of Concepcion, Civil War, you know, and my my grandparents, World War One, my World War Two with my dad, my, uh, my dad also fought in, in Korea, I fought in Vietnam, my daughter is in Desert Storm, and my son is an Iraq veteran. So we have a deep history going to that since the beginning. And so these burial grounds is a cemetery and I am providing y'all with these records. I'm sorry that we didn't have 16. I think we only brought 12. In it, it outlines the issues about only that the federal government can advise us of whether Section 106 applies. And if you really think about it, at the very least, when you start going into that river walk, you're going to have to involve the, city, uh, the, the civil engineers. That's going to create a federal thing. Now, yes, NICRA can go out there and they can turn around and invoke all of these things like Randy Barton says, but we got lineal descendants here that are Native people. And we have standing. The standing and our presidents of the burials that we have preceded in the past. Now, I'm not here to dispute who is and who is not Indian. Okay, that's not my <coughs> job. But we started a process in 1995, that's taken us to, to this day to get the standing, to be able to establish through genealogy, our own pockets, our own resources, our own blood and sweat, to go through this process. And it's just not reburying the people because we take responsibility for those things. I personally have reburied an ancestor inside the Alamo in 1995. And here last year, I reburied another one outside in the plaza. Those things just don't happen to anyone. It's because they know our record. 
They know that we're committed. We know the responsibility. And so our request review of the project relates letters of the federal agency jurisdiction determination. We have not been informed as of yet. I implore you to look at these things and get this involved and involved, and at the very least establish an MOU of some kind with the real descendants that have been able to demonstrate by their actions for the last 40 years of the work that we have contributed to this process. I served in the 1994 uh, Alamo Plaza, and I can look around and I can count the people in one hand that were involved in this process. All right, thank you, sir. We really appreciate your comments. That was six minutes, yes. Next person is Forrest Baez. Thank you to the commission for letting me talk today. Uh, my name is Forrest Baez. I'm a sixth generation Texan. I'm an Alamo defender descendant. My great great grandfather fought in uh, Battle of Gonzales, Concepcion siege and battle of bear and was one of the immortal 32 that answered travis's call to reinforce the alamo uh, i'm for the plan i'm for moving the cenotaph his name is the first name on the west side of the cenotaph i'm for closing the streets to give reverence to the battlefield and the mission plaza and everything that went on there cars driving on it are not very good you know for the reverence of the, of the plan um, so I just wanted to say that part, and I, I hope you all uh, will give that in consideration. Uh, there's been a lot of work on the Citizen Advisory Committee and then the other committees on doing this plan, and a lot of thought and everything went into it. So that was just my piece. I appreciate you on your time. George Cisneros. George Cisneros, I'm the District 5 of Alamo Plaza appointee. Uh, and I see the 16 of y'all, and y'all have an attention and a focus that's pretty impressive right now because this is pretty heavy stuff that we're discussing. Uh, well, I've had people, we've had people here in the last few minutes who are speaking about the past and their connection to that earth and that stone in Alamo Plaza. And I look at your names here, and they do reflect old families in San Antonio who have put volunteer time as Boy Scout troop leaders, PTA time, volunteers on commissions such as this. You've served in the military. You've worked on commissions and worked with all sorts of things. These families that y'all represent are deep. And I'm asking you today to realize that you're hard work and your commitment to this needs to be directed is do you really want to lease San Antonio property for 100 years to another entity? Do we really want to give control away for 100 years? Only 12, about 12 hours ago you were just leaving your houses to go to work, put a full day of work in grab the IT and come over here and do this commission work. That's 12 hours. But what we're just really discussing is 100 years. Look at the lease. What are we giving away? What are we losing control of? And from the very beginning, the plan always was a smoke screen to me. It was making a bunch of stuff happen. But the crux of the matter is 100 year lease and governance. Those are the only two things that we must be concerned about at this moment. Everything at the cenotaph, it's important to some people emotionally, but it's not like giving away land for 100 years and giving away governance. Read the lease. The state of Texas will have the right to release our land to a third party. What if they do it to Disneyland? What if they do it to Six Flags? What if they do it to the Alamo Trust? we will lose our governance and our control. So those of you who come from families deep, who volunteer and really care about San Antonio, 100 years is a long time. Your grandchildren may have already passed in 100 years. So think of it, in year 99, who on city council is gonna say, hey, 
next year's 100 years, we want our land back. So let's think about that very, very carefully. Because I don't know that 50 <laughs> okay. plus 25 plus 25 means 100. And thank you for your attention. You all, and thank you for your service to the community. Next, Robert Benavides. Good evening, I'm Robert Benavides. I was a member of the 1994 Alamo Plaza Committee. Um, and uh, it's kind of exciting to see some of the plans that were presented tonight, uh, although not yet complete. Regarding the Alamo Plaza, Plaza lease that's been proposed between the City of San Antonio and the Texas General Land Office, there appears to be a, uh, a question about the Alamo Plaza ownership that needs to be addressed before anyone goes forward. Uh, while doing some online digital research in the city archives in the city clerk's office, I found a 1871 document that, uh, regarding the conveyance of the Galera building by the Catholic Church to the city of San Antonio for $2,500. Uh, most of y'all know that the Galera building was the low barracks main, main gate entrance. And uh, there were no documents found, however, in, indicating that the city of San Antonio had ever purchased Alamo Plaza from the Catholic Archdiocese of San Antonio. The Texas Supreme Court in the 1850s uh, settled a lawsuit when the city of San Antonio filed a lawsuit against Bishop Odin, uh, certifying and approving the fact that the Catholic Church owned all the land of Alamo Plaza, uh, of the Alamo Mission, and all the other missions in Texas. It was originally started by the Acts of the Republic of Texas in 1841, but it was certified on that basis. It was done because uh, the city wanted to lease the land of the Alamo that they believed they owned to the uh, United States Army during its stay there and found out that the representative of the Archdiocese had already leased it as owners to the uh, United States Army. So they filed suit and they lost. Now, the, the ruling indicates too that they owned all the property and the outbuildings up to a maximum of 15 acres for all missions in perpetuity. That's in the wording, the copies of that too. However, it says about the conveyance, going back to the Galera, that shows the meets and bounds in that document that y'all can all look up, that is strictly the footprint done by City, City of San Antonio Surveyor of the footprint of the Galera. And I believe it says something on this order, that the, um, it being understood that the property conveyed on condition that it should be dedicated to the public as an open space and be made part of and one with the plazas above and below known as Alamo Plaza that belong to the church and Plaza de Valero that belong to the city. I hope that y'all will address that sometime very soon because a third partner, a stakeholder, has not been included and that's the church. Thank you. Next question I have is Sharon Davison. I had really great notes when I started this. I lived downtown, and my first access, you know, concern was access. Name and address, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Sharon Davison, live on Clockett Street downtown. Um, my first look at this was access, and then I pulled up the entire 18 pages of the lease document, and having heard what's said here, I wholly agree that we have to look at that, that control. And when you start reading through it, not only is it control of the space, but control of the economy around that space. It allows for fees to be charged, for vendors, for concessions, for all of those things that we're giving up. And in closing, because that's the only way to control that access is by those access points. You know, right now, I can leave my house and literally walk half a mile to the mall. I can cut over, I can be there. You're taking that space and 
expanding it to what 6.7 acres and in closing that that does not lend well to tourists of saying hey i can go over there on my you know lunch hour from my meeting or on my way home from a meeting from the convention center to my hotel or etc that access that ability to interact with the historic space and the public space is what we're giving up as well as the economic level of that you start looking at who controls and allows things in and that you know, it's, it's very disturbing to see a city we appreciate a partnership but not when we are a minority partner and we lose our ability and even in the reading of it it says you know the city manager cannot unreasonably withhold a request to charge in those pieces and there are specific dates and times where we're going to have access to what is our currently our land that we're giving away and one of those dates is even march 6th the most important day at the alamo so those are the issues that i come with of the accessibility the public space the control of not just the space but the ability you know giving up that economic space you know, because what is what's the GLO really getting out of this? They're getting the ability to charge people for something currently that's free, and that's a huge concern when we're talking about a public space, access, all the things that we're told here about the interaction and the ability to absorb it and you know get that experience at the Alamo. Thirty seconds. That's my concern, very much so. Yeah. You know and not having the ability to go in and out and appreciate what it is and having someone else control how and when I interact and giving me their experience, not my experience. Thank you very much. Next question I have is Colleen Schroeder. Is there a Raymond Schluter here? Yes. He has my time. Okay. Hi, Colleen. Thank you for coming. We have six minutes. Okay. Hello, my name is Raylan Sluter. My primary residence is 1048 Hillside Oaks in Bulverde, Texas. I have a home in Councilman's Trevino's district. The councilman that says, we're listening to you from this whole deal. He's had his mind made up since the very beginning of this thing. And he wants to move the Cenotap, that he wanted to put it in the San Antonio River. I'm a seventh generation Texan. Um, my grandfather, Gordon C. Jennings, Amanda Cannon on the north wall of the Alamo and died alongside William Barrett Travis. My grandfather fought in the siege of Barrett alongside Forrest Baez, his family, and died at the Alamo. So it's hard that some of us Alamo Defender descendants, and I'm a member of the Alamo Defender descendants, have chosen a battle that we fought against each other. Forrest's family also fought in the Civil War, and so did mine. We fought and died in battles, and the politicians have come in here and created another battle to move the cenotaph. Think about this. Councilman Trevino and Mayor Ron Nuremberg stated a year ago that the cenotaph should be moved to a more appropriate place. Okay, so I would have a question with each and every one of you. How would you like me to go to your family cemetery and dig up the headstones of your loved ones and move them to a more appropriate space. There is no crosses at the Alamo. If you listen to the Ballad of the Alamo by Marty Robbins, you will look for a cross, one, and you will never find one. Santa Ana took the men of the Alamo, stacked their bodies up like cordwood, stripped them naked, and set them on fire. The remains sat there for over a year to be picked up in the wind until Juan Seguin came a year later and buried him. The Cenotaph is an empty tomb. It sets only a few steps from where the North Wall was, where many hard fighting was. Now, they want to talk about, well, it should have been here and it should have been there. Well, the shoulda, woulda, it's been there for 80 years. Leave it there. The Cenotaph should sit there. There's a study from 2014 that we had to get a study to show that these people these fine gentlemen that are making lots of money off this project that have no vested interest or blood in this that said the Cenotaph could be paid in price for like $200,000. Why should we spend millions of dollars? Also, I don't know if you're familiar with, the Republican Party passed Plank 296 by a 93% passage 
uh, for the cenotaph to set in place and the Alamo grounds to be preserved. There's currently state reps working on this. Is the city of San Antonio planning to pay for all this when and if the money gets cut off? Because I've talked to a lot of people, and if you listen to talk radio, a lot of people aren't for this plan. They think it's absurd. Why would somebody want to move the cenotaph other than we don't like the men's names that are on there? Because it's more appropriate to re-move it. Now, my family hasn't been here some as long as some of the other people, but my family paid for Texas freedom with blood and sacrifice. These people here, they're sitting on these committees talk about, oh, we want to have the reenactors so we can have an experience. Well, the Alamo's not Disneyland. There's a lot of heritage groups that are made up of people that like the Alamo because they started collecting Davy Crockett lunchboxes and John Wayne's Alamo. If you want John Wayne's Alamo, Brackettville is probably for sale. Buy it. Make that Alamo. Take care of the chapel. Take care of the long barracks. Build a museum, but leave the cenotaph alone. There's no reason to spend millions of dollars. Unless we want to do what we did, would like to do with monuments nowadays. We take the cenotaph apart, and it falls apart. Uh-oh, we broke it. Now what do we do? You know, I'm not real smart, you know, but, you know, why? Now, I don't know how you guys vote, but I'm sure y'all work for the city, and I'm sure y'all probably have a rubber stamp back there, because that's like the city likes to do is rubber stamps, and I don't mean to insult anybody, but we've been to, like, many of these meetings where Councilman Trevino says, we're listening to you. But there's never been an option for the Cenotaph to stay there because Mr. Trevino doesn't like the Cenotaph and some of his predecessors that were involved in some of these planning don't like for what the Cenotaph stands for. We know how the former mayor spoke of the Cenotaph, his mom did, of the Alamo. We do not need to quote that, that how they despise everything that the Alamo stands for. There was nothing but drunks. Well, there were men of honor. Unlike some politicians nowadays, you know, why would a 56-year-old man leave four women, four children behind to come die at the Alamo? Why would somebody from Gonzales, Texas, 32 men, come to die at the Alamo knowing that there wasn't nobody coming? Why would a courier ride back into the Alamo knowing that there was nobody coming? Makes no sense. These guys have fine plans, but, you know... Seconds. We need the Cenotaph needs to stay there. And why are we giving up our rights as a city to the state of Texas? I wouldn't trust any politician, whether they're Democrat or Republican. All they lie, once they get into office, they all want to leave their mark on the city or the state. Thank you. Bravo. Bravo. Do you realize how much you are messing with people's emotions on these issues? For real. As the man just before we mentioned, that Alamo, that place of honor, that shrine, is an inspiration to every single person who comes by there and views it. And you want to close off Alamo <coughs> Street, which allows people to squint, these glance at the darn thing. You realize that that street is there to not only let them glance, but become inspired so that they will park their cars and then walk over to it and see everything in it. Alamo Street and Houston Street, you want to close that off too? Allowing more traffic jams? <laughs> the cenotaph. Yes, 
Maybe it wasn't on the exact spot where the bodies were burned, but it was right where the battle was. And you want to move that? Please understand, you're saying, well, just, just 500 feet. Uh-uh. This is a symbol of a conflict that we, the citizens, have with you, your, our representatives. You want to do something that you think is in the best interest, so-called best interest of us. Uh uh We see this as a battle of between wits. The, um, the, once again, the Alvo Street, the parade route. I don't know why the, uh, the parade organizers sold out. Yes, so out to this plan. 30 seconds. But we want the parade to run through the Alamo. We want it to, that's our symbol. We don't want it just merely stopping there and, and going off route. We want the whole parade to run through it. And finally, the lease. A lease for a hundred years? I'm sorry, I am a Republican and I do not trust George P. Bush on this stuff. No. Years. No. Three minutes. Thank you. Next person is Susan Green. Good evening. I'm Susan Green. I'm a downtown resident also. I've been in San Antonio about five years, and I've been most proud to live just four blocks from the Alamo and Alamo Plaza. I'm here because I want to challenge you on the uh, Historic Design Review Commission to do the right thing and stop this plan. Uphold the provisions of the National Historic Preservation Act and also the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Preservation. It applies to everything that's being proposed here. And that is that changes this is uh, number four under the historic preservation, standards for preservation. Changes to property that have acquired uh, historic significance in their own right will be retained and preserved. This very clearly applies to the cenotaph. There is no reason to move it. It is historically significant in its own right. It is a contri significant contributing structure to the National Historic Site known as Alamo Plaza. It complements, it is the most complementary thing to the National Historic Landmark of the Alamo. It tells the story of the Battle of the Alamo. The, um, and it is where it is. It was designed specifically for that location by Copini. The spirit of sacrifice is there on the ground where the blood was shed. To move it outside the walls exactly. of the fort, off the battle line, off the historic battleground, even though it's only 500 feet away, it loses all significance. The symbolism is meaningless. Copini did not design this for any other location than where it sits right now. The, uh, You've heard from many how significant this, uh, the cenotaph and the plaza, the buildings, everything at Alamo Plaza is to uh, many people. It has their cultural significance, historic significance, family significance, and it should not, should not be moved. Uh, there are also deed restrictions, which um, clearly uh, support that. Uh, that it shall be uh, maintained as a memorial in honor of the heroes of the Alamo, and the city agrees that the property shall be used only seconds. for the purpose for which it is intended. Please stop this. Don't be a rubber stamp for uh, revisionist history. Be Alamo heroes. Insist that a Section 106 review process be conducted so that all uh, all parties can be included in the process and it can be handled properly. Three minutes. Thank you. Next person is Brandon Burkhart. Brandon Burkhart. Yes, ma'am. Give me a second. Just say.
My name is Brandon Burkhart, I'm the president of This Is Texas Freedom Force, a uh, nonprofit organization here in the state of Texas that holds over 18,000 members, and our mission statement is the preservation of Texas history and protection of Texas rights. Our motto is protectors of all things Texas. I can tell you right now that this moving of this Alamo Senate tap that Roberto Trevino and McDonald back here, along with George P. Bush and some of your other cohorts like Nuremberg, is not what the people of Texas want. And I can tell you that more than anybody can because our organization travels the state on a regular basis. We talk to thousands of Texans. We have sat down at the Alamo Cenotaph and spent hundreds of hours talking to tourists and Texans alike, telling them about the, the city's plan and what they plan to this, do to the cenotaph. And you know what the number one question we get is? Why do they want to move the cenotaph? Leave it alone. Yes, it wasn't there in 1836, but it was put there in 1936 to represent those people that died there, to represent the Texans that stood for liberty, stood for freedom against unbeatable odds. We have also had two engineers that have come out and actually surveyed the blueprints and looked at the Alamo cenotaph. And they have said that it is highly probable that the city will damage the cenotaph if they attempt to move it. And the price tag to then repair it is going to be so high, then they'll, they'll say, well, you know, we don't have the money to fix it. Which is where the first plan that they first came out with was to demolish the Alamo cenotaph. And that's where we think that Trevino, Nuremberg, and some of the others stand at this point, is they want this damage so bad that they don't have to put it back up. And they don't have a good track record because you can look at the Travis Park Monument, which we railed against them removing that. It sits in the Alamo basement, uh, the Alamo Dome basement, excuse me, with a broken butt on the gun and a broken barrel on the gun. Not only that, some contents of the actual time capsule have been lost inside of the actual time capsule. And a hole that was about the size of this was put in there. We don't know if somebody actually stole the stuff out there before the, the lawyers were able to get the UDC in there to actually look at it or not. The city of San Antonio does not have a good track record. We could rail against this entire Alamo, reimagine this Alamo plan, but we have chosen to pick the cenotaph as our, our line in the sand. And we will stand there seconds. and fight that every single day all the way up until the end. And I tell you what, George P. Bush, his days are numbered because of this plan, because Texas don't want it. If the majority of Texans, like Douglas McDonald back here will tell you, well, the majority supports me. Well, if the majority of Texans supported you, then put it up for a vote for Texans. Let Texans be able to decide. This is not for somebody that came from up north down to Texas to visit to be able to decide. This is not from somebody like Nuremberg that came from Boston to Three decide. Minutes. It belongs to Texans. Thank you, sir. Carrie Hillier. Carrie Hillier. My name is Carrie Hillier. I'm the research director for This is Texas Freedom Force. I live in District 2 in San Antonio. And I was glad to hear our person here from the design team, Eric, say that the plan is intended to honor 300 years of the site, including the history in the 19th century in San Antonio. The cenotaph itself is a historical artifact. It's a monument designed by Pompeo Capini, specific to the location where it is currently located. And the structural elements are specific to the cardinal directions, north, south, east, west, that they face. This is well documented. It's been studied. Gopini was an Italian immigrant. He came to this country penniless. The only thing he had was his experience in Italy and his training in art. And he put it to good use. This monument was erected during the centennial year of the Battle of the Alamo as a monument to honor the defenders of the Alamo, many Mexican citizens, Tejano and Anglo, fought and died in that battle on that site. The defenders of the Alamo don't have grave sites for their descendants to visit because their bodies were burned 
under orders of the Mexican dictator Santa Ana. <coughs> Descendants from across the nation come to San Antonio to visit the site where their ancestor died in the quest for liberty from oppression from a dictator who had abolished their constitution. That is the reason for the Texas Revolution. Because the dictator Santa Ana had abolished their constitution. They had settled this area, Tejanos and Anglos, under the understanding that they would be protected by the constitution. When it was abolished and they were told to turn in their arms, they said no. And they fought and died for that principle. Those descendants come to the battleground where their ancestors died and where the, where the monument built to honor them is located. The city has done no feasibility study to determine that this important monument can be moved without damaging irreparably. The loss of this 82-year-old historical monument would be tragic to the residents of San Antonio who treasure Texas history, and it would be a dishonor to our ancestors who fought and died at the Battle of the Alamo and in the Texas Revolution at battles prior and after that one. Please do not do this. Thank you. <laughs> Next question is Rick Briscoe. Mr. Chairman, members, uh, I am Rick Briscoe and I rest in District 9 of San Antonio. The area we now call Texas has a long, proud history. There's a focal point that leads us to where our existence is today. Instead of a single star, lone star flag, and the flag of the United States of America, but for the Battle of the Alamo, there'd be a two star flag representing Coahuila y Tejas and a Mexican flag flying over San Antonio. The defenders of the Alamo are who we hold in very high regard. This entire plan is most suspicious. I attended the January hearings of the Senate Finance Committee and I'll tell you the short version, they were very displeased with the lack of transparency on the part of the GLO. And I'll summarize the plan as being unnecessary, undesirable, and unwanted. Unnecessary because there's very little, if anything, that cannot be accomplished by much simpler means. Undesirable in that it diminishes the significance of the Battle of the Alamo and makes the entire experience poorer. Unwanted in that throughout the town where there have been public hearings, the public has spoken out against this bloated plan. Now let's look at a couple of isolated details of the proposed closing streets. Well, our engineer friends have a really nice looking computer animation. But it's garbage. Garbage in, garbage out. It's an old expression about computer. And it applies here because at one of the public presentations, they admitted they hadn't even consulted the merchants who would need trucks to resupply them with their, their merchandise and their daily goods and so on. It would directly affect the traffic flow study. What was that study worth? A great big round number, nothing. Had it been a presentation to a private business, it would have been followed by the words, you're fired. Now, let's look at a couple of other small details. Uh, insignificant things like reverter clauses and deeds. Notwithstanding the opinion of the city attorney, I, seconds. I submit that this plan will trigger the reverter clause and the church will own the Alamo Plaza. So please vote for this plan so we can get it out of the hands of the city of San Antonio. Think about that. This is a half billion dollar project that need not be done. Any number of people could do a much better job for a pittance. Proud Texans would do it. Thank you. Last person I have time to speak is Frank Adelman. Frank. 
Frank Adelman, I speak for myself only. Yes. Um, I was born on the banks of the San Antonio River, as a lot of us always say, the Nick's Hospital. And my grandfather opened the store on the main plaza in 1901. My daddy was born on Marshall Street and everybody else still hanging around. Uh, I'm a lawyer. Love giving advice. <laughs> the concept, I listen to everybody at these meetings and everything. I get upset. I don't get upset when I talk fast, which is impossible. I mean, impossible. I like to plan. Having the museum is great. Having the Alamo fix so it won't fall down is great. Having the public 24-7 is great. What's bad, it's not bad, but I would ask you in doing due diligence, go find an attorney, or if you're an attorney, go home and reread the lease. It's <laughs> pathetic. I don't, what's in it, I. The substance is fine. It's so poorly drafted. There's so many holes in it. We could go to court forever for construction. But what I think, giving you advice, what you ought to do, the buildings across the street, the Texas won't tell you what they're going to do with them. They'll keep them. They won't keep them. They'll put the museum in some. They won't put the museum. They'll make a facade. Well, it's not time to do a lease until you know what you're leasing. The other half of it, the Alamo. They're arguing whether they should take six feet of dirt underneath the Alamo and go back to the original foundation, or just leave it there because the ground is dry now, not wet like it used to be. And how's the city going to know how much earth they're going to have to move to make it beautiful? Well, it's going to end up beautiful. We're going to have the museum. We're going to have the beautiful area. But then the streets. OK, why don't you do this while the state is figuring out what they're going to do <laughs> to the building so you'll know what you're getting for your deal and what they're going to do with the Alamo so you know what you have to do for the deal with the dirt and cleaning up and things. Why don't you close the streets? 30 seconds. Most personal friend who would kill me if you heard me close the streets. I won't mention the name. You know who it is. Close the streets for six months or yeah. how long and they tell you what you're going to enter into yeah. and see what you've got. Exactly. Old parable. They're building a new college. The guy says, build the college. Don't put it in the sidewalks. They build the college. No sidewalks. Why don't you put it in? Wait a year. Why you wait a year? You put it to see where they walk. Then you put in the sidewalks. Okay. <laughs> Seriously. That's three minutes. Um, Thank you. Okay. Well, that was the last question. <laughs> and that was the last speaker. Yes, that was the last speaker. Right. Well, here's my suggestion, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, um, I'm grateful for the civil tone that we're seeing tonight. Uh, and I'm very appreciative of it as uh, appreciative of that as I think all of the uh, commissioners are. Um, and uh, I, I, I think that I, I want to compliment all of you for presenting your case as well and for doing this in a civilized manner, which is, as we all know, pretty out of fashion these days. So thank you from all of us. Um, but uh, being only human, I think we need to take a little break here because people have been drinking coffee and water and, and all that. So, uh, let us take um, about um, 10 minutes, 5 minutes, do you think you can do it in 5 minutes? Okay, alright, we'll do it in 5 and then we'll be back for discussion. Thank you. So, uh, we're all back and for the record we are resuming after the break that was uh, called after the citizens to be heard and then we'll have a discussion and questions. Uh, let me make a point of procedure here. Um, it's been suggested that since we're sitting here as a committee of the whole, um, that as each of the commissioners from their respective commissions want to ask a question, um, they be recognized by their individual chairman. Um, I'm not really sure how to manage that because I'm trying to see the end of the dais here. And frankly, my compliments to the staff because I don't think you get this many chairs here. Anyway, um, it may be better, I think, if we 
simply, if they have a question, leave the microphone, it has to be recognized, and then we'll do that. Is that okay with you, sir? Yes. Okay, good with everybody? Let's proceed. Good evening, everyone. I'm Andy Segovia, the city attorney. Um, unless there are specific lawsuits, and I didn't hear any of them that were mentioned that are active, uh, I'm not aware of any federal lawsuits uh, that currently impact either the Alamo plant or the Alamo lease. Okay. Uh, just, to, just to reassure, the different concerns that were brought up throughout this evening, um, there are no concerns. We've looked into them. And, and oh, I mean, I can, I can answer specifically, like, I mean, I, I think there was an issue on Niagara uh, in its application. Uh, that is an important federal law. Uh, its fundamental purpose is to identify, uh, preserve, and repatriate uh, items that are of, of significant cultural importance uh, to Native American nations. And uh, we fully recognize that. Uh, there's nothing though that, that's in the lease or in the Elmo plan that per se you know, violates or inconsistent with that law. And in, in fact, in the lease, we acknowledge that, that both the city and GLO will comply with all federal laws. So we're, we stand ready to comply with that <coughs> if, it, if, it, if the issue comes up. Oh, good. 
whether the ordinance uh, 08197 <laughs> Is that, I don't think that's an ordinance. I was like, I think a section to a, another the federal law. No. Oh, the cenotaph. Okay, I can I, I can address the cenotaph. Yes, the cenotaph, as some people pointed out, as long as it's the purpose is to honor uh, the people that uh, uh, the, the heroes of the Alamo, which under the Alamo plan, that will still be what the purpose of the cenotaph is. Uh, so we're in compliance she, with that. She asked you to discuss ordinance okay, 08197. You, you have yes, not. I'm going to wrap up my comments right, again. I just you. want to reiterate the, the why. Um, and it's really for this experience, enhancing the experience, and enhancing the sense of arrival around um, our Alamo, um, a key aspect of our city um, that attracts several different tourists. And I think that um, we have a <coughs> with that master plan. So I am in support of this master plan. Any further comments or questions? Thank you, Commissioner Gonzalez. Um, I couldn't hear you, so yes, I am. <laughs> um, I, first of all, um, I'd like either staff or Jean Dawson to answer the question. Um, one of the um, uh, speakers uh, referred to uh, the uh, utilities plan uh, if if the streets are changed, then what's going to happen with the servicing the uh, businesses along the streets? Thank you, Jean Dawson. Uh, as I mentioned shortly in my presentation, we have engaged uh, the vendors and suppliers in the city of San Antonio. Uh, that has been very productive so far. We've learned a lot. Uh, I think even if the Alamo plan worked out there and being considered, uh, these vendors and suppliers needed to be engaged. Uh, a lot of the commercial loading zone signs that you see around downtown were put in 30 years ago and no one knows why they're there and why they're there for 30 minutes. And uh, we really, uh, what we're proposing to do and, we, and, and engaging the suppliers and the vendors is look at the entire downtown area uh, and the core and uh, create a delivery system that is uh, more controlled, more deliberate than it is today. It's everybody's kind of on their own and fighting for a space. So uh, we've had very productive meetings and uh, we really think there's a solution for downtown. Uh, clearly other cities around the country I have implemented uh, delivery uh, programs that the city of San Antonio can follow. So, and I, and I believe, you know, we're not going to move forward on, on anything until we have a good delivery plan in place. Thank you. Then let me ask staff the same question. Uh, Mr. Dawson stated that the uh, uh, transportation plan, uh, the closure of the streets would not occur until the delivery plan was in place. Is the city staff saying that that is going to happen? Are, are you confirming that there will be a delivery plan before the streets are closed? Yes, and actually that is in the lease agreement that we are going to be doing that service and delivery plan prior to the street closures. And as Mr. Dawson mentioned, that is underway. And we have our second meeting with the stakeholders coming up, I believe on Friday. Thank you. I'd like to ask the city attorney a question. Uh, yes, ma'am. Someone in the audience uh, was referring to, uh, uh, I guess it's the Federal <coughs> Historic Preservation Section 106. Yes, that's the one, frankly, that I'm not familiar with um, on that. <laughs> well, I'd like to have someone explain to me. We have somebody on, though, that, that, that is familiar with that that can answer it. What's your question about it? Uh, Randy, I'm sorry, I don't know his last name. I believe he was talking about 106. Or it may have been someone else. Uh, but asking. Uh, Ma'am, I was talking about NACRA and the judgment period file. Ramon was talking about 106. I'll get you the next Okay, okay. So We're on commissioner questions now, everybody, please. I can down. explain just generally. Section 106 is, is 
a section in the National Historic Preservation Act that requires um, review if there's federal if there's a federal undertaking involved in a project. So if there's federal funding or federal permitting is required or anything along those lines. And to this point, there is no federal funding. It's not a federal undertaking, and so Section 106 does not apply to the project at this point. Actually, it does under the budget. Thank you. The, uh, my other question is about the uh, NACRA. Can the city attorney explain to me uh, why this was brought up and why some people think that this might stop the project? It's, uh, it's my understanding, I think, that some people uh, are that uh, there's some are taking the position that there needs to be an agreement before we move forward. But again, uh, NIACRA it had, establishes a process by which uh, there's the identification, preservation, and repatriation of items that fall under, including uh, remains. And so as we implement the Alamo plan, that act may be uh, brought into play depending on uh, what, what, if anything, is discovered in excavation or in construction. But again, there's nothing in the plan itself per se, or nothing in the lease that uh, would preclude compliance with the act. Will there be more uh, excavations made uh, as the plan proceeds? I think under the Elmo plan, there's some plan for excavation, uh, but uh, exactly how much and where, I don't think it's yet been fully defined. Those are all my questions right now. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to refer to applicant. I think initially you all can figure out who the question should be addressed to. One uh, issue that was raised by one of the downtown residents was this access and what kind of limited access there will be to these six plus acres in that area. Now, I don't know if there was some misapprehension as to exactly how much of that six acres would be closed. And so if you could please go over that uh, for the benefit of the commission. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to talk a little bit about the site management and how we've actually expanded Alamo Plaza. The idea is that uh, right now, because of the elements that are on site, uh, it is very difficult to define the, the mission footprint itself. And so the mission footprint is, is the element that we're talking about having a managed site, or a managed site during museum hours, not the entire plaza. So the entire plaza is now being expanded from something that, that is really almost non-existent now because of the road, the roads that cut through there, to something much more expansive that goes all the way down to uh, Commerce Street. So you imagine all of uh, the street that's Alamo now being part of the plaza, uh, the area around the Menger, and so forth, adding to, to that space. All, the, all that space is, is open. The mission, the, the historic footprint is what we're talking about of being managed and that is about uh, how many acres but the, the mission footprint we're, we're, that we're talking about is at one point yeah no that's what we're talking about 1.1.3 so as, as the overall site is about six, it's growing to six six acres but the mission footprint itself is much smaller so when you say that that area say from the soya towards the alamo footprint and then down towards the Torch of Freedom, that, or Torch of Friendship, excuse me, different Torch. Torch of Friendship. Um, that would be open to the That's public 24 7, not managed. Correct? Not managed. That's correct. Um, although by the way, there, there is a section that, that uh, through, through the actual uh, footprint of the museum, is going to be a north south access, a very wide north south access for anybody who's traveling north south uh, through the site. And I think that brings me to sort of one of the second concerns uh, raised by the public today, which was this idea of charging for access. So that north-south access would not be charged, is that correct? The, well, that north-south access will not be charged and neither will access to the Mission Historic Footprint. Everything that's free today will be free tomorrow. There, there is no charge to get onto the, the historic Mission Footprint. What, what we're simply asking is that 
as part of the orientation. And it is, it is part of our, our vision and guiding principles that were set nearly four years ago. And four years ago, it, it was asked to simply orient people before they arrive to the complex. And that's, that's what we're trying to do is give people some level of orientation before they walk onto the historic footprint of the Mission San Antonio there. And so, um, sticking with this access point, I'm sorry, I'm using probably more than my share of time. But, you know, so we have the primary access point through that north south interface. Then we're going to get up the access point slot at this point. And then we have, uh, I believe, two other access points to the battlefield footprint. That's right, some ancillary points. And so those ancillary points would be available to the public. Um, After museum hours are closed, is that correct? Well, no. So after museum hours, uh, the, the site is completely ports. The the ancillary, uh, the additional two points, access points to the site, are for during museum hours. And what we what we stipulated is that uh, in the lease, there are certain dates that we we've, we've indicated that we'd like those entrances to be open because we know that there's going to be lots of activity. For example, certain dates during fiesta or uh, specific uh, calendar dates that, that the mayor or the city council would like to identify as part of, of activities that we know happen downtown. For example, like Final Four, uh, we wanna make sure that, that those are access accessible, as well as the idea that uh, the museum director has the, has the, the ability to open those up if, if that person deems it uh, uh, necessary or appropriate to open them up it may be so for example overflow or maybe there's no activities going on on the site and, and it's just the time to go ahead and, and open it up and get people access so those additional access points are for museum hours only <laughs> that, that gives you up to three access points if needed uh, there's there's uh, a one formal entry point that we want most people to to go through because we want to orient them to, before they get on site which is always going to be free after museum hours or before museum hours the, the site is completely porous with six opportunities all over the site to get onto the site. Um, I'd like now to move on to the Cenotaph, if possible. I know that that obviously is perhaps one of the primary points of contention as we move forward here. Um, one of the things that has been raised, one of the issues that has been raised in this public hearing is um, this idea of a feasibility study on the moving of the cenotaph, if that were to occur. Can you address that? Yes, uh, we intend to, just like every other piece of this project, move uh, thoroughly and thoughtfully about how we would uh, relocate the cenotaph. In fact, to, to uh, address current issues of the cenotaph today is something that, that, that we, want, we want to obviously take care of because it's, it's currently in, in a bad state. Uh, if when we relocated, we would rebuild a, a new superstructure, a modern superstructure. I think it's been suggested potentially a stainless steel structure. To do it on site the way it is is actually more difficult because you'd have to remove it from the site to rebuild the structure anyway, and then and then put it back together. So uh, we will be using uh, subject matter experts, engineers, uh, and be very careful about how we move forward on this. This is. It's, it's also been said that we, we're not necessarily concerned about the cenotaph, and we can tell you this is a, this is an important piece of of the, of the site. This is about making space for all the history at, at the Alamo, and so we, we have an intention to to relocate the cenotaph. And of course, we've discussed this before with this group. Is that uh, we're still fine tuning the, the uh, specific location, and we'll be coming back to HRC with that plan as well. Okay, and so that's. Oh, I'm sorry, of course, please. So, um, today's action is actually requesting final approval for the relocation of the Senate tackle. However, the Office of Historic Preservation, um, which is led by Shannon Miller, um, her office must review the repair and relocation plan prior to any commencement work, uh, the work, any work beginning. So, I was going to get to that a little bit later, but while we're here, okay. um, you know, if we look at the agenda items for uh, the HDRC portion, there is under uh, G on the agenda memo, I'm sorry, there might be a little difference here. There's an additional sentence regarding exact positioning and final plaza design that we consider the future date. And 
so is that going to come back to this commission or is that going to be dealt with administratively by the OHP? It'll come back to the commission and I'll, I'll ask Shannon Miller to speak to that. Yes, um, anything on city property will will ultimately have to come back for final approval and, and that would include the final location of the, of the cenotaph. So the actual plaza design would come back for final approval to the commission. And so even though we're giving or we possibly may give, to be more precise, uh, final approval for uh, dismantling, repair, and reassembling of the Senate, uh, it would still come back to us at a later date. Correct. Um, I think Shannon is not going to be here too. I'm almost done. I apologize to my fellow commissioner. That's what we're here for, sir. Um, with respect to uh, the Woolworth, Crockett, and Palace raised repeatedly by the Antonio Conservation Society. I can only speak for myself uh, as to how I feel about the importance of those buildings and the preservation of those buildings. And while the HDRC does not deal with the lease, uh, one of the items on our agenda today is the conceptual approval of the treatment of the historic Mission San Antonio de Valero Plaza site and general design concepts. Would those buildings be considered part of that? No. Um, the buildings are owned by the state of Texas, and so we do, the HGRC does not have purview. Although, as part of the lease agreement, the HGRC will have the opportunity to review and comment on what is proposed for the buildings in the overall lease And so, is there any item on our agenda today which we could indicate or otherwise take some meaningful action uh, as to the preservation or the desired preservation of those buildings? I mean, so I, so I want to point out that we did do a study that you that you all have in, in um, the information packet about the historic significance of the buildings, and that has been provided to, um, and will continue to be provided to whoever is selected um, for the museum design, and um, the GLO is also working on a more in-depth study, like a structural analysis of the buildings and all those things, so they are definitely being considered heavily um, because of the historic significance of the buildings. And to answer your question, um, none of the actions that you will take today um, directly impact the buildings because they're not within our purview. Um, but I, I don't. There's no reason why you, as an HDRC, couldn't just make a statement that you encourage the reuse of the buildings or whatever you want to say. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Right, um, and I would like to make an observation uh, about the condition of the cenotaph and some other items related to it. Um, I personally have no doubt um, that it's in desperate need of attention, and reading through Copini's own memoirs, he was furious that the state of Texas and the federal government, which was funding it, didn't pony up $3,000 to waterproof the interior of it. So it's been leaking like a sieve since it was erected. And if you look at it very carefully, um, there are many openings in it, and they're in all the wrong places. Um, the leading capstone on it, which is a chamfer piece that you see on the south end of it above the allegorical figure, you can see daylight through it. And so after the kind of rain we've had this last month, all that's been cascading through the interior. Uh, it's held up by an armature which is concrete. Uh, but we don't know what condition it's in. And concrete that is constantly wet, as this has been for almost 80 years, um, can have the danger of the rebar, the reinforcement bars in it, uh, expanding and bursting. So we don't know if it's doing its job holding up the interior. Um, so this is an urgent investigation, and there's really no way to do it from the outside. Um, we can x-ray it, uh, we can do LIDAR surveys over the surfaces on the outside, and we can certainly detect if the blocks have been moving, but we don't know what the inside is going to look like until somebody opens up and look at it. So whether it moves or doesn't move, it's going to have to be at least partially disassembled. This is my professional opinion. Um, then there's another thing, uh, which is the discussion about whether it can be moved, if that is where we choose to go with it. So I want to report that, by the way, um, everybody's talking about their ancestry tonight. Mine is Italian. And so Copini is a figure that's very important to me and to other Italian-Americans in Texas because he's sort of our hero. He's the first one of us who got some public credit for his work. So I've been always very interested in all of his work, including the Senate 
So um, I um, have worked and been to visit the quarries and bronze foundries in Italy where he would have worked as a young man. And there is a tradition of the way the work is done, which is that it's done at the quarries. This was also the case with the cenotaph. It was not carved in Texas. It was carved in Georgia and shipped here. It was probably partially assembled there to do a test fit. It was not erected, but it was put on a train and shipped to Texas. So it's already moved halfway across the country. If they didn't break it with the very uh, limited means they had in those days, I'm confident that we will be able to responsibly disassemble it and reconstruct it wherever it goes. But let us remember that the stones that it's made out of have traveled a very long distance to get here to us. All right, thank you. Um, I've attended several briefings from staff over the last few weeks and seems like at every one of them we get some different comments, different answers to questions, and it seems like this is a moving target. For example, uh, the graphic I have in front of me about street closures shows just the streets in front of the crocodile block between that and the chapel, whereas I believe on one of the images that was shown earlier also included the sale of their album. It's just one example. Uh, also, I'm, I'm very concerned about access. Um, up until this evening, I was un I, I understood that there would be three point minimum of three points of access when the museum was open, and now we're talking about one point and maybe uh, two others will be open if, if the waiting time exceeds a certain length. So that's another moving target as far as I'm concerned. Uh, one thing that I'd like to bring up that is important to me, but may not be to a lot of the other commissioners, since I'm a landscape architect, I have concern about the existing vegetation on the site, specifically the trees. Uh, not, not mentioned very much this evening was the lowering of the grade within the compound. And that's going to have a major impact on existing trees. I've heard that they will be dug up and moved and stored and then brought back. I know that can happen because I've been involved in projects where we move large trees in the past, but mortality in that sort of an operation can be very high. Um, also, along on La Soya, uh, the graphic that was shown did not, very conveniently, did not show all the trees along the soya, which would definitely have to be removed in order to accomplish the uh, two-way traffic on that street. So those are issues that I'm concerned about. And at this point, I'm, although we're looking at a conceptual approval, uh, I have a great reluctance to uh, uh, lean in that direction. I think there's way too many things that are still vague on this uh, proposal to be even considered for conceptual approval. Commissioner Christopher Garcia. Yes, we've seen a lot of slides today and throughout these presentations. I was wondering, can you show us the slide that has the um, the burial grounds and the archaeological sites? And what I would like for um, some of the staff to do is kind of highlight, um, I don't know if we have a later point or not, but um, things like the parade route and what streets are going to be closed and what street, where the streets are now so we can see how those interact with the archaeological, archaeological sites and the known burial grounds. Is that a possibility you can get from staff? We don't have that particular slide in this deck. Oh, there it is, actually. Yeah, I think we can use that one. I, I, I think I know you're talking about there's another particular slide, but we can, I think we can use that one. Okay, so, sorry, let's answer some of your questions. You were, we were talking about the parade routes. 
Yeah, the because we have several streets that we're being asked to um, close or modify. There's a modification at the parade route, and so I was wondering how those existing items, how are they when you overlay them with the known archaeological sites and the burial grounds? Well, as you can see, and you see the red dots, A, B, and C, uh, up on um, Houston and, and Alamo. Uh, that kind of helps to define the north wall there. As you come down, uh, we know that that area in particular are, are some known burial grounds and uh, proved to be uh, part of the, the reasoning for uh, how we explained the, to the uh, Battle of Flowers group about their parade being rerouted around the historic site. So one of the things we, we try to do is, is to make sure that we're telling the many stories that exist there. Of course, that's the last bit, little bit that we can demonstrate is the North Wall and the history of the North Wall and how that's, we know that, that Travis was, was uh, stationed there uh, during the, the last siege on the Alamo and, and passed away in, near that site. So we'll be doing some interpretive uh, site work on that particular piece. And of course, part of the reasoning is that the closure of the road itself, uh, the, the road, the, the street is is literally right on top of the last bits of, of archeology span that are on that north wall. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one of the questions I do have is regarding the use of the plaza for um, free speech, that is something that was shown on one of the slides. And I was wondering, will that still be allowed? We've had several U.S. presidents decide to give speeches to the public in front of the Alamo. I'm just wondering, how will that be uh, managed once it becomes more of a museum and so on and so on and We are designating a free, free speech zone that is just south of the historic mission footprint. What we know is that, uh, again, the mission, the historic footprint which is uh, just a, a smaller portion of the overall Alamo Plaza uh, is, is a site that we're trying to make sure that, that we hold reverence. So we will be designating a free, free, free speech zone that is in close proximity to the, the chapel and all the historic elements. So we feel, again, we're, we're providing a, a space that will help to acknowledge all the historic features of the site, uh, many of which we're revealing for the very first time. Okay. And um, I know the Cesar Chavez March currently ends at the Alamo, so is that getting reworked? Yeah, and so it's, it's much like the, the Battle of Flowers Parade, and I think that, that there's still a lot to, to do here. In fact, you know, uh, people have been asking me a lot about the next steps and how quickly we're going to get to these, these portions, and I, I would say this is the beginning of a much longer process to, to start to really define some of these elements we've been talking about conceptually. For example, the ceremonial activity zone and what that means for the parades, but also what it means for other elements like the Cesar Chavez March, uh, like the connection of the Cenotaph and, and how we can potentially uh, you know, help to, to uh, refine some of the locations of these new design elements uh, that are located on a more hardscape site. So what we, what we know is the Mission Historic Footprint, we're gonna, we're gonna be removing the, the hardscape features, the road itself, and now what you're talking about is, is very, very sensitive ground, archaeological grounds. Um, south of that is where we're, we're locating all these elements, and we do anticipate uh, continuing a lot of these traditions that we see there today, and of course we, we expect to see many more new traditions happen. Um, it, it sounds like um, <laughs> some of the things that the audience have brought up is, is kind of the history of the, the land transfer of the Alamo as it's been through and any other deed restrictions. I'm assuming that city staff has looked to make sure that all the plans comply with such items, like uh, making sure the plaza is open as a public space and stuff of that nature. Right, we looked at the, uh, the deed restrictions. There was a lot of comment on um, the deed from the Catholic Church. We did take a look at that. Uh, there is no reverter clause in that deed. Um, and we have looked at that. We've uh, have an opinion on that. Um, we've looked at case law uh, where you have similar deed limitations on other property that was deeded to a city and we have had cities that have built zoos, uh, we've had cities that have built libraries on spaces that have had similar limitations. So we're fully confident that uh, in terms of that deed we're fully compliant with the Elmo plan. 
Thank you. My next question is, is more for the curiosity of the engineering. Will the museum be built to the city of San Antonio codes and amendments, or will it be built following the state of Texas codes and amendments? Again, the, the, the building itself is owned by the state of Texas, and so it will be following the state the guidelines. Um, so far, the plans we've seen today and then throughout these presentations, they look like chrome. But those of us in the refer to the schematic design, pretty much. And so as we get closer and the design gets uh, fleshed out and we get more to the construction documents, we'll leave you more opportunities for public comment. Can we have the members of the public please either whisper to each other? Thank you. So, so I guess the, you know, what we're excited about with this museum design is that we've, we've received over 35 uh, response, responses to the RQ. A lot of uh, amazing talent from all over the world has responded to this. And uh, we feel that we're, we're here and we have an opportunity to select some of the greatest uh, talent to take a look at this uh, challenge that we have to help give us uh, quite an amazing museum and really uh, tackle this uh, changing of the experience at the Alamo. At the heart of this is that the management committee, which is made up of the, the city of San Antonio, uh, myself, Cheryl Scully, uh, the Alamo Endowment, which is Gene Powell and Ramona Bass, and the general land office, which is Hector Valle and Brian Preston. We'll, we'll be moving this along, along with the Citizens Advisory Committee. We've committed that the, the, uh, the plan will be moving forward and, and work with the Citizens Advisory Committee to help inform a lot of the elements of the plan. The final approval will come to HDRC. Uh, of course, you will be informing THC on that. Okay, thank you. Um, with the streets closed, how is the, the entry going to be managed? I mean, has that been worked out yet? I mean, we've heard about uh, a limited of uh, maybe three entry points or maybe six during the evening, some sort of, there's maybe gates or walls or house. Has that been even worked out yet or is that further, a further design development? Yeah, there's still more design work to, to do, but what, what I can say is that uh, we don't know what that formal entry uh, looks like because it's part of the museum and visitor center design which we hope to begin here very soon. Uh, what we know is that it's, it's not gonna be a simple doorway or, or, or a turnstile. It's, it's obviously what we want is to create a very dramatic sense of arrival uh, to truly orient people. It's, it's, I'm using words straight out of the vision guiding principles. Uh, we, we're, our, our, our goal is to change that experience that is there today, which is really uh, uh, an experience that is lacking, like lacking a sense of place, sense of orientation. And so as we move forward with the plan, we expect a very, um, a, a sense of arrival that, that I think is what we call a formal entry point now. Uh, the two access points uh, are also there in, in addition when needed. Um, it, this, is, this is about changing the, the experience uh, for, for those that are visiting the site. And we expect more people to come visit the site. Uh, and so our, our goals in the design are to make sure that, that we're meeting the what we expect to be uh, an influx of, of visitors to the site, both local and and uh, those that are visiting San Antonio. So uh, in, it's it's difficult to tell you exactly what it looks like, but but it's, it's about getting people uh, oriented on the site. It's, uh, we can say it's uh, it's going to be quite grand. Thank you. I do have a couple of questions on the lease. Um, if the citizens decided that you know we don't like what the GLO is doing, and they all pick up the phone and stop by our council people's offices and say we don't like something about it, right? Whatever it is, uh, how they're managing it, uh, maybe the, the programming, or well, maybe the city doesn't like how they're managing it. Maybe you guys or the city manager says, hey, they're mismanaging whatever. Um, what are the potential remedies? How does that work out? I'll let the city attorney handle that. I, I think we wrote some of those provisions. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. We've included in the lease a pretty ro robust dispute resolution process. Um, what we have found, what I have found in terms of, of agreements like this, which long term um, and you have a pretty complex issues, it's best to 
uh, build in a dispute resolution process that identifies issues early on. Uh, the management committee will do that. Um, and then there's an elevation process that if issues don't get resolved, they get elevated. Uh, ultimately, though, if there's not uh, agreement, uh, we can go to the courts. We do have remedies for the city. Uh, uh, if the GLO is not compliant with the lease terms, uh, those are, depending on what the uh, breach is of the lease, the, the remedies are key to what the, the ultimate uh, breach of the lease is, all the way up to termination. But I will tell you it's a high hurdle to get to termination. Uh, we hope we never have to get there, uh, but that it's there. And uh, the example I used earlier is, for example, if, they, if the GLO tries to build an amusement park, I'm exaggerating, obviously, we have clearly the right to terminate the lease because they're not complying with the outlaw plan. And I noticed in the, in the lease, it sounds like the uh, city asked for, for control or for certain days. Can that be amended as things happen and you decide, you know, there's other days of significance or there's a... In fact, we've built that in as a, as a, as a uh, the flexibility as, as new days uh, and in fact, as based on data, uh, what obviously we don't know a lot now until it's actually implemented and once we actually get data on entry in terms of timing and everything there's flexibility in there to adjust those thank you um, speaking of data one of my other questions um, I know we saw the traffic study in the video but I was wondering was there any studies on the peak pedestrian traffic in front of the Alamo Over the last uh, two and a half, three years, we've done multiple pedestrian studies, uh, direction of access, peak hours of access, uh, and so we we understand today, uh, you know, clearly in the summer, spring break, it's a whole different story than it is, uh, you know, maybe out there uh, today. So we have a complete picture of the pedestrians and, and where they're coming, and it did inform uh, the plan that you see in front of you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, that's pretty much the base of my questions. I just think it's important to make sure that we do include the, the Native American history that's in the Alamo and the uh, civil rights issues that we heard today. Those are also important. And, you know, it looks like everybody in this room, everybody in the city cares deeply about the Alamo. We all have our members. And some, some of the people here today, obviously, uh, they their ancestors and their, their uh, family has shared blood and otherwise have uh, more recent memories. You know, I myself have marched in the parade in front of there. And I remember when my niece and nephew came and we, you know, bought a last buy and went in front and took our picture. Uh, so I can understand the emotional attachment we have to this uh, historic site. And I think that's part of the reason we need to treat it as such. And my final question is just one that's rhetorical is I wonder where would we be today if in the late 1800s, early 1900s, the entire site of the Alamo was treated as it should be? instead of sold off in pieces and mm -hmm. sometimes literally brick by brick. Mm -hmm. So I wonder what would be today. Mm -hmm. That's it. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Ozeman. So I'm, I appreciate, again, the passion that's behind what we're doing here today. I'm going to just speak about my experiences. Um, my family and I enjoy the historical travel. I can tell you we've been to Mount Vernon, Fort Sumter, Charleston, Gettysburg, Pearl Harbor, the National Mall. And one of the experiences that we really enjoy is kind of the place setting, the place of arrival. We don't have that experience at the Alamo. And so when you arrive at it, it's really just this diminutive building in the middle of downtown, and you don't have that sense. I think the plan here tries to establish that sense of arrival, and I think it is very important for both the historical traveler. And what, what I'd like to ask is kind of the, the, uh, the museum itself, and, and we talked about the building, but what about the artifacts within the building? Where are those being sports fund from? And are those at risk to not assembling and being able to share the story of the Alamo if we don't proceed with some type of building to exhibit the exhibits? Can anybody speak to that staff? Okay. Well, actually, you're speaking to the heart of what the cooperative agreement was all about. Uh, in 2014, the city began a process on its own to, to start the Alamo Plaza <coughs> and uh, this one the state came in and asked a partner 
along with the Alamo Endowment. And what we see is this, this is an opportunity to make this one place right now because of the way it is it is subdivided. We have different elements of the project. And so the idea is to, yes, make sure that we're, we're uh, unifying everything. It is part of the vision guiding principles to, to make sure that we are uh, being thoughtful about uh, all the elements and so that we can begin to tell a story, uh, a story that will be institutionalized by a museum uh, and, and protect the, the, the tangible artifacts, but also uh, help to recover a lot of the stories. And uh, you know, as was expressed, you know, we, we want to make sure that we are uncovering all those layers, telling all the stories, and telling a complete, complete history at the Elmo. We heard testimony today also about uh, the source of fundings uh, from the state that might, might be at risk. I think. Can you speak to the source of funding, both the private and the public, uh, the security that those funds are available, and also the ongoing uh, uh, funding for the maintenance of the programming of the Elmo? The, the city of San Antonio has allocated about $38 million towards this project. The state of Texas so far has allocated $106 million. And the rest will come in $200 million plus from private donations. And as you can see, the, the city's investment is $38 million to what we think will be a half a billion dollar investment on the site with incalculable uh, economic benefits to to the area, to the property itself, and to your point about uh, creating a, a sustainable model that, that allows us to to recapture the footprint and, and, and run a, 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 a site that that is that is going to be well funded and uh, last for many years to come because we have taken a look at uh, all the elements that that can help capture some of those revenues and resources so that we can express that history. Thank you. Thank you for uh, the questions. I am really excited about this. I am from Mexico, my accent, and from many other countries as well. I am used to going around the world, and I think one of the commissioners mentioned, this is our chance to show the world the real Alamo. You are all very emotional with the Alamo, and I feel like that's where we need, that's where we are. We're not giving it the respect it deserves. We are going there to get a raspa and take a picture in front of it. We're not going inside. There's not much to see. By building this museum and bringing the original artifacts from there, actually making it a central entrance, go see it. And not only the church and the facade, everything else that's around this plaza, we're actually going to be able to show more. The cenotaph being there where it is, and being further down, actually, you'll have more access saying that you have more close family to the cenotaph. You have access to it 24-7. I think we all are. Um, on that section, and also I want to say, nobody mentioned the torch of friendship. You're giving it respect that it deserves. Yes, it's very hard to go there and actually take a picture, and that represents my two countries coming together. Mr. Chairman? Um, I'd just like to reiterate my appreciation to uh, the city staff. Some have been here very late and working uh, all day long uh, to the uh, representatives uh, for each of our districts and to the public that's been here very focused and earnest and articulate in, in their concerns. And uh, I just want to make a few comments. I'm actually a very enthusiastic supporter of the master plan, but I have some very grave concerns about some aspects of it. And unfortunately, those are aspects that are sort of beyond um, our control by, I think, somewhere by design, uh, or by the dynamics of between city and state within Texas. Uh, I understand that that is a dynamic that's very delicate and that it's been you know, a delicate thing to broker over time. One of my concerns actually has to be more with the management of the site over time. And there's been some discussion about that. I've read very carefully through the uh, through the lease agreement and also through the package that was given to us. And there are two precedents that were shown in the package, uh, one of which I, I visited but don't have a lot of knowledge about how it is managed. And the other one I know quite a bit about because I helped to craft the management plan for it. That's the 
uh, Independence Mall. And in that case, and it actually I understand in both cases, neither one of those historic sites are managed in the way in which they were anticipated to be. And so I think that we need to be very careful in how we proceed with the implementation of the lease and the plan because sometimes there's unforeseen events go on. And it has been mentioned, the Secretary of Interior Standards, uh, there was item four uh, that was mentioned earlier in the uh, Conservation Society's very well-crafted letter, but there's also concepts of reversibility that need to be uh, taken into account. If you do things that are, irre are irreversible, uh, you know, what do you do? Going back to Independence Mall for a second, it was, it came out of the Sea Beautiful movement. The Sea started in the 1950s, but really didn't get going until the mid-50s. And that was a high watermark for urban renewal. And in a very hard, you know, ham-handed, ham-fisted way, hundreds of buildings were removed from three blocks of the center of the most historic part of Philadelphia, all for the sake of a very narrow interpretation of the site. They left all, well, they left only one building uh, other than in Venice Hall and the, and the flanking buildings, and that was the, the Quakers' meeting house, because it fell within the 18th century narrative of the site that they wanted to have constructed there. Now, I mention that because then in the 2000s, something called 9-11 came along, and there was a very reactionary attempt to lock down the entire site to help protect it. And that's when I got involved in it. We got to examine things like blast radiuses and backpack bombs and things like that that were pretty horrendous to imagine. Um, but also, as they were constructing Lori Oldham's uh, master plan, they came across the footings of the slave quarters at the president's house. And that just happened to coincide with the entrance to the new visitor center that was envisioned there. So I mention these things because when we look at these sites that have complex histories, sometimes complex things come up as we dig into them. And we've got to be really careful that we're not doing things that are irreversible. And so I'm very concerned, and unfortunately not so certain how, well, what kind of leverage we have over this, but very concerned about an entire swath of buildings being treated in a much more like an urban renewal kind of way, just cleared away, and we lose, you know, an essential portion of the history, the continuum of history of the site. Um, so I don't have a solution for that. I hope maybe we can craft something in our in our uh, our motions here that might earnestly implore that the GLO listen to the professional experience of the THC staff and uh, treat those buildings with the property they reserve. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
to try to address, as the councilman said, special events or occasional events uh, where there may be parts of the plaza where it would be for a private event. Uh, we've already talked to the GLO and we'll clarify that in the lease. It wasn't uh, intended to be one where it would be a permanent fee, but it was, it was meant to address those situations where you might have a special event or occasion where you might charge a fee. All right, thank you. Uh, then, uh, could someone put a picture on the screen uh, to show the area which is really under the control of the state and will be closed off during certain hours, uh, but the rest of the area will be open to the public. Cheers. If I, if I may repeat the, the question you're saying, so after hours, there's portions that would be closed off that are owned by the state of Texas? Well, what I'm really asking is, what if the scenario is considered hear you. tonight? What if this area that we are considering tonight will always be open to the public? The, the, the plaza itself will always remain open. There, the, the church, uh, which currently uh, is, is shut down at night. Uh, the church and long barracks will, will be protected overnight, uh, and so will the museum. Now the plaza itself, and you can see, now if you look over there, there you, okay, so you see there's a dotted line in, uh, almost right up against the long barrack. You see the little dotted line that it jogs in a little bit. From that, that little line, that's the portion that will be closed off to protect the, the two existing artifacts, the, the church and the long barracks. Everything else in the plaza will be open. Would someone put a pointer up to that and outline it, please? We don't have a laser pointer, just use the mouse. There you go. Can you see the mouse? Yes. You, you can walk on Crockett Street. Well, okay, so with the pointer on that line, are you saying that everything to the so-called right is open to the public or not? No, that's the part that will be closed. That right. is owned by the state of Texas. That includes the gardens, the lawn barracks, and the church. All of that will be closed? That is correct, like it is today. Well, what do you mean that it is today? So after hours, the gardens and the long barracks and the church, that area essentially is closed down from the public. Okay, and everything to the so-called left that is, and is open is at a, all times to the public? Uh, Non-museum hours, it's completely open. During museum hours, you have a formal entry, but you do always have 24-7 access. Well, I assume that you go into the museum then you can go anywhere on the left hand side. That is correct. For free. What do you have to pay to get it? You don't have to pay. You have to pay. Have to pay to get into the one entrance that would be open? No, you don't have to pay anything. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Um, I just have a most of my questions have actually been answered at this stage, um, going through uh, our purview of the lease agreement and the road closure. So, you know, at this time, I would like to just thank staff for everything they've done. This fantastic amount of uh, fantastic uh, presentation today and a ton of information. Um, actually, took quite a while to review and and, and read and understand. Um, thank you, Gene, for your your traffic analysis and the and the moving pictures. That's pretty awesome. Uh, and thank you, um, everyone, for coming tonight and, and speaking and, and voicing your opinion and, and your passion for being here. Um, my, uh, you know, like I said, most of my questions have been answered. Um, I do have a couple uh, lingering ones. One is, um, is the lease agreement finalized? Is that the final language? Uh, as I said, there's one, I mean, there's one modification we've already talked with uh, GLO. Uh, but it will be finalized before the council votes on it next week. But I would say that what you have in front of you is pretty much the lease with some potential clarifications, such as the one on 
on the uh, potential charging of a fee for occasional events. Right, yes. I'm glad that that's easy clarification. It clearly says that they shall not charge and they shall not allow, you know, uh, uh, vendors lease or anything like Correct. that. Correct, right. Right. Pretty clear to me. Um, and I think I, I I missed part of this conversation, but uh, the GLO today currently operates the Alamo, correct? So as we move forward, if this plan comes to fruition, the way it is operated isn't going to be dramatically changed from the way it's being operated today. That is correct. Um, what happens when the lease is over? You know, I mean, it's 100 years from now, but what, what happens? <laughs> at the end of the lease, there is an option to purchase by the GLO at SB and market price, uh, and it has to be approved by the city. Um, and if they do not exercise an, uh, the option to purchase, uh, the land goes back to the city. It's a lease. Uh, so not only does the, the land go back, and anything that on it goes back to the city. Okay. Um, and the process for Woolworth building, the Crocker building, and the Old Palace building, um, you know, I know there's a lot of questions as to how that's all going to be, you know, strung together, how that's going to be, um, how the museum will be, you know, will be put in there, and, and those buildings will be, you know, I guess let's use the word repurposed. What is the process for that? I mean, I mean, are we, you know, the outside is going to be left the same, and the inside there's just going to be some continuing conversation on how to how to make them fit together because they're different floor plates and architecture and whatnot, or how is, how is that moving forward? Well, I, I dare not compete with the 35 talented uh, respondents to the RFQ. I, that's exactly what we're, we're going to be working with them on. And, and that's what we, what we hope we, we get is, is some opportunity to discuss uh, what, what, what available technologies can, can uh, provide uh, some, some answers. But it, this is about a creative process. Uh, allowing the, the, the talented individuals to to um, approach this in, in a thoughtful way. We want to do everything we can to incorporate these buildings as part of the design, but it's hard for us to give you an answer about how that design uh, is going to be done. We, we, we don't want to be prescriptive about it. Yeah, but I get, you know, I guess my real question is, I guess the city and the GL are going to have input as to what the consultants are, are coming up with. And it's going to be kind of a kind of a roundtable kind of discussion as to how it all comes. We're doing that right now. So we, we sh we're, sh we're in the process of shortlisting the 35 uh, uh, entrants to the RFQ. And uh, we'll be discussing that through the through the existing process, the process that, that's got us here today, which is the Citizen Advisory Committee, the Management Committee, and the Executive Committee that have, have uh, really been about bringing a lot of people together, a diverse group of individuals, to uh, provide input, insight about what we're doing with this entire project, and uh, all that continues. And we're, we're moving forward together on that. So uh, we think that that this process has been an incredibly thoughtful process that that has got us to this point. We intend to continue that. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. That's all my questions. All right, and I believe we have a question from Commissioner Wolf. Yes, um, thank you everybody for hanging with us. I feel like we're in the home stretch. I want to say we're getting there. But obviously, we're all here because this is important to all of us. So thank you for hanging in there. Um, we have all had a lot of the presentations, and I think that um, thank you again for all of the input. I think this is a very compassionate, very considerate, very collaborative plan. Um, and that we've considered the employers, the employees special interest groups, tourists, local school groups, residents, community groups, um, and all the stakeholders. One of my perspectives is about the access. And I know we've talked about the street access and managed access. The street access, I drive Alamo probably three or four times a week. And I'm always worried about hitting somebody. I go very, very slow there because people step off that curb. It's right there. Um, I have no problem closing those streets simply because I want it, it to be a revered space and I don't want us to drive over what should be an honored space. On the other hand, I take an educator lens, um, because that is my background, and understanding that telling a story is a scaffolding experience. Um, I do, however, like most of us, I think are conflicted when we talk about barriers. 
and they do impose a barrier that limits any reasonable access. Um, but you have to start somewhere when you're talking about an educational experience. And again, that's the lens that I'm using. Um, I want physical conditions that elevate the experience. Um, but I think one of the things that we've been briefed on a couple of times is what those barriers may or may not look like. Lori, could you explain to us a little bit about some of the considerations of those barriers that have been discussed to this point? And that's my only question. Oh, sure, thank you for the question. And so, as a reminder, in May of 2017, we were looking at the glass walls that had barriers anywhere from eight to 14 feet. And now we've taken those glass walls down and we do have barriers, but we're calling them railings. They have yet to be designed. Um, we think they'll be about 42 inches in height um, around a historic Mission Plaza. And it could be a landscape barrier. It could be a metal barrier. Those have yet to be designed. And those will be things that the management committee will be working on throughout the next couple of months. And that'll come back to HGRC for a final approval. And Commissioner Peck, I did want to add that you're correct that the GLO, they do own the church and the long barrack and the garden. Um, but they contract with the Alamo Trust to manage the actual Alamo, which is the church in Long Barrack. Thank you, Larry. Yeah. Mr. Commissioner, uh, my comments were, uh, and I appreciate the public's input, and I appreciate the, the staff and the city and all the commissions, and I think it's uh, an outstanding job. I, I did approach this with a very skeptical eye. Uh, I was concerned of why do anything at all. And it is, as my fellow commissioners have pointed out and all those who travel, there's something lost in the experience of visiting the Alamo. And I do agree with the, with the comment that the Cenotaph does tell the story because there's not any other place that does tell the story. And the, the reason to move it, I think, it, it is a very strong one in that it can be relocated and still be respectful and what I didn't like is one of the initial comments that that the, the Senate needed to be removed uh, because it was out of scale and I thought that's very much akin to you know uh, complaining that a flagpole is tall and pointy that's what it's supposed to do and for visitors that are there they have nothing other than, to do than kind of hang out walk over to the Senate and it's beautiful and, and I really enjoy it. I, it's one of the things I love about working downtown. And I too travel Alamo Street almost every day. And I walk past there and I talk to people. It's, it's a beautiful space. And so I think the, the initiative and the impulse of this is not change for change's sake, but change to enhance an experience, to tell the story that there is room for improvement here. And as my planning commissioner counterpart said, you know, this development has been haphazard over the so here's a chance to get it right and do it better. And conceptually, uh, I, I was very much skeptical of the access. Uh, I've been reassured and I sat through several presentations and I've seen it develop and I've seen those presenting take input and revise and redirect and improve on what has been uh, uh, presented. So this, this idea that I was opposed to of a single entry point it seemed rather, rather constricting. It's a concept of access to an axis. Where you enter on a church, where you enter in a site, where that is, it is very important. It's a, it's a, it's a way to, to make a place and, 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 and to begin an experience. And, you know, my, my view of the historic buildings, you know, if you walk in front of them, you can see just about eight feet in front of the facade where the walls of the Alamo used to be. In, in my view, is if, if it's too close, there's no need to demolish. The buildings can be relocated. A lot of the buildings on Commerce Street were relocated in 1950s and make the street wider. The, National, the uh, Alamo National Bank was moved 15 feet, and that was just with manpower and mules. And, you know, we have much more uh, uh, better technology now so there's, there's things that can be done, and I think overall the concept of, of making this a, a better place to tell the story it, it is all around well done and well thought out, and I appreciate the efforts. 
Commissioner Brunson. Uh, thank you, Commission and everyone for asking these questions. As far as what is going on, there seems to be a lot of questions not answered. We have a lot of questions here today and commenting on some of these things that we have. Interpretation seems very vague of what is actually being done. So I do have a question as far as the transportation study. Is there also any real data done for the pedestrian, maybe the safety studies or anything that we can show community or that we have? Well, as we move forward with the plan, you know, as you see today, you have a, a concept plan. And then when you go from con concept, you go to schematic. And as you do that, you take all those studies and you put them together. And, uh, and then you come forward with a final plan. You combine the pedestrian information with the traffic information and the landscape design along the streets and the bicycles. And those are the next steps that we will do uh, in the plan and com combine all of that information. So as you're saying, there's still not enough information to say, give enough people what they need to know about blocking off roads, only making it pedestrian, even though we're suggesting that, and also changing the mobility around the outcome. You were asking, I thought specifically about pedestrians. It's just like all of the plan. We, uh, the design team hasn't selected the rail. It hasn't selected the, uh, the type of service surface in the plaza. Um, and the type of trees, where the trees will go. So the exact pedestrian plan, uh, the exact sidewalk plans, those have not been worked out yet. That's the next step in the process. Thank you. Um, as far as the least, uh, as far as, thank you, that was all. Um, as far as the least concern, I guess maybe for staff or attorney, as far as the question is. Um, I would like, I guess, a clarification, maybe not just for me, but others, the, year lease I guess it was 25 can you do you have the quote there as far as what it is specifically oh the or how long the lease is the term of the lease is 50 initial term of 50 years which can be extended for two additional 25 year periods and was there any mention of a third party that I heard earlier <coughs> in there? Um, no, after uh, the expiration after the expiration of the of any term uh, GLO has an option to purchase at market price, but again, the city has to approve that. Um, and if, if at the end of uh, any, uh, the, if they don't extend the lease, or at the end of the second term, extended term, then the lease terminates and the property goes back to the city. Thank you. Um, is there still a represent representative from the Conservation Society here? There's Susan. Yes. Hello. Yes. Thank you. Um, as it says in your letter about the third paragraph down, equally concerning are the lease terms. Could you elaborate on that? Um, it says equally concerning are the lease terms which will require all animal visitors to pass through a single entrance. During that's that's Patty's. <laughs> but no, you're that's the that's argument that you speak. We do have a concern with the single entry. And why is that? I think it's managing people. I think most of this was done to manage people. And you have access. I think if people were allowed to go in and you didn't have the one access there, but they were allowed to go in, then you could roam through the, the plaza like you can now. You still would have the option to go to the museum. It seems like there's just the focus on the world-class museum for the one, the one entry. Yeah. And as it also says here, um, extensive discussion and design regarding the mission period from 1836, how do you think that would be compromised or not enhanced? Wait, I'm sorry. That's the last paragraph on your letter here. Right. She studied hers, I studied mine, but we've, we've, we've been discussing this for some time. Um, we really wanted just to be sure, I mean, there's been so much focus all along about the mission period, the, the battle, and not coming forward. 
you know, the plaza has a long history. And also the history that we talked about with the Woolworth building that we think is very important. Those buildings are important also. I hate to keep going back on the buildings, but they really are important. And it is one of those things that once they're, they're gone, they're gone. You, you, you can redo the streets, you can redo the entries, you can redo absolutely everything, but not the building. And so much of the buildings and the rest of the plaza has to do with the history. So to us, it's important not to just stick a plaque up there and say, guess what? Here are the lunch counters. But to have the building and have things that represent the rest of the history around the plaza and not just the battle. The battle is important, but there is so much more. I think the indigenous people have also you know, stated their case as far as what's important as well. So that you're able to tell the entire story is important. And are you in partnership still with the daughters? No. Okay. Yeah. Do you know I am a daughter, but but we are not in partnership, and we do stand alone on our statements. Thank you. And I'm not a daughter. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I believe we have a question down at the end of our dais. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to follow up on my previous comment. I know that there's been a lot of thought and effort and energy put into this design, and I appreciate everyone involved. I would just like to see a little bit more detail before uh, considering for, concept, for conceptual approval. I do have a question about the museum. Uh, at the on-site meeting recently, uh, Councilman Trevino, you mentioned the possibility of including the Hyatt Garage, and I wonder if that's still a consideration. Yeah, I mean, we're we're all we're always looking for opportunities, and um, that is that is something that's ongoing. It's not solidified just yet, so uh, we we hope to to see that be a part of the project potentially. But it's like any other uh, piece of this project. As as people learn more and more about the the, the work that's happening at, at the Alamo, uh, we're seeing more and more partners uh, come in and join us with, with this potential project. I think inclusion of that uh, facility would take some of the pressure off of the demolition of the historic buildings and also the sale of the uh, Potentially. And I, and I would say, you know, our, our, we've never stated that our, our goal in any way is to demolish those buildings whatsoever. We, we do plan to incorporate them. Uh, it is part of our vision and guiding principles to tell all the stories at, at the uh, Right. Uh, my apologies to the uh, Planning Commission. I uh, cut one of the commissioners off in, in questioning, and uh, I do apologize for that. It, I think we're all getting a little bit flash here, trying to see each other at the end of this bias, but uh, please do continue. And again, my apologies. Thank you. Um, as far as also asking the questions, um, as far as the community is concerned, uh, Don Dixon. Don Dixon. Do you come up with You said it's in representation of your wife and the daughters and the women of the cenotaph. How is that important to you as far as where it is now to where it will be located or what the idea is? The cenotaph, <coughs> in terms of the original agreements between the United States, the city, and Capini, designated where it was going to be. And it is, and, and my viewpoint they made the right decision it is it is where it should be and I think it should be calculated thank you very much That's all. I'm just in my opinion as well moving this in attack is almost in my personal kind of life is like moving the Washington Monument from one place to another yes it is a great big deal here in the Alamo but it's also something that's very sensitive um, we talk about moving trees and also blocking things Yes, that they are to the right. As we have pictured up above that it's closed as it is now and open. Um, I would just like a little bit more detail as far as pedestrian safety, mobility, um, things that say that's the next step, and that says that you've already approved something and have sold this lot to already go forward with something that a lot of information is not being carried over and has not actually been detailed from the lease to maybe public meetings and also 
obviously what a lot of people in this room have questions about. But, um, thank you for your participation and everything that you all have done here and the committee for sitting this long and doing this. Um, I would like to hear more from the community as far as people and uh, all different ages. And it's great to have these technical questions, but also like to let them know more technicalities and everything to the specific specifics of actually what is going to go on because there are a lot of loopholes that's going to actually you know, kind of burst and like actually contest what we actually do with the outcome. I would just like to remind members of the Planning Commission that our purview is the street closure and the lease agreement and nothing else. So when you're considering for your vote, only take those two items into consideration. We're not responsible for the Senate to have for the other issues. It's actually the first three bullets on the agenda. And when y'all are ready to make a motion, we'll put the agenda back up there so you'll see it. All right, I believe uh, we have one more commissioner. We have some comments from the ACRC. I had two more here. Okay. Great. Um, Thanks everybody for uh, your comments today. Everybody um, on both sides, I feel like, uh, is very passionate about moving this project in the right direction and the way that's best for the city. Um, we, we've heard a lot of discussion about detail and um, you know things that are very important to move forward historically. And as a as an architect, I feel like you know the comments that have been made about where we are in this process is accurate. I mean, we are very much on the, you know, we're not we're not even to the schematic design yet. We're in that conceptual pre-schematic phase where we're trying to uncover all of the problems and we're trying to do our research to get the data to where we can make that decision for, for the best design possible. Uh, I've seen the list of the selected designers that have uh, put their, you know, put their hat in for this project and it's really, really impressive. Uh, it's, it's world class, um, people who, uh, base their their living off of being sensitive to these issues and making decisions that are best for the entire city. So I think that you know that that says a lot to to me about the the way that this group is approaching this project, and it, it gives me a little bit of comfort on the next steps and on the details that we can see in the future. Um, today, we're basically giving them permission to move forward with design on some of these concepts and, and to uncover some of the detail. And I think that that's really important. Um, the, the research that we've done regarding the, the restructuring of the, the Cenotaph, you know, making that whole again, uh, the parade routes, capturing back some of this sacred space for our civilians and for the citizens of San Antonio, I think is, is critical. Um, capturing that place and, and making it a place, you know, again, it's not, captured, it's not even up by the city, it's, it's becoming its own place again, and I think that that's really important. So I thank you all for your, your comments. It, 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 it's made an impression on me to, to take to the next round of these discussions and, and to ask more questions and to be very sensitive to the things that you guys are wanting more information on and more more data on. So I just, I just wanted to say thank you to the commissioners as well. So thank you. Commissioner Cigarro. Thank you. I want to thank everyone who's um, here and has stayed so long and, and committed to this. I appreciate everyone's comments. I especially want to thank staff and everyone that's been involved on this uh, project. I'm sure it wasn't just a couple of years in the making. I'm sure it was uh, several years in the making. And um, I appreciate everyone's input and fellow commissioners as well. Um, I have a question for, I guess, uh, city attorney. Um, with respect to the lease terms, um, I assume that the defined term of Alamo plan will be in its intent is as amended, correct? Because I assume the Alamo plan will consist of construction plans and designs and everything that will come later on. Correct. I mean, well, it, it, it's, it's based on the current Alamo plan, but it doesn't it, uh, envision that that Alamo plan will evolve as uh, the details are added on once we get into you know past concept and into the, the studies and design elements it does uh, allow for that flexibility okay and um, I assume the, you all may have discussed this or at least documented this and um, that neither um, well I don't want to say neither the city but the GLO won't claim any kind of sovereign immunity from any 
breaches or damages that the city may have against the GOO? No, that's why it's, it's structured as a lease. In fact, that's a good question. That's one of the reasons we wanted to structure it as a lease. Commissioner Garcia. Can we bring the uh, time up with the, I guess the after hours uh, access points? I have one question of, I don't know when Commissioner Cautious was asking. So the, the dash line represents what area would be closed out to the public after hours. And I can totally understand, understand uh, wanting to protect the animal and the lawn barracks. And we've all heard the story of the rock star doing things he shouldn't be doing there. Um, but how close and how will we be able to still experience those buildings? I mean, are we going to still be able to uh, enjoy everything? So we be able to take their photographs? Or is it a case where, you know, we're not going to have to be tipping toeing over a privacy fence and that kind of thing? Uh, no, uh, in fact, it's pretty much what, what you experience today. And so the, the idea is to, to make sure that the artifacts, which are going to be undergoing a, a very significant amount of rehabilitation starting next month, um, that, is, that is a critical part of this plan. And, um, and currently, the site is the, the church and the lawn barracks are protected at night. Uh, people can walk up, take a picture, uh, and that will exist in, in this plan as well. So the data line basically represents uh, oh, essentially what is there today. Okay, because it, it looks like it's quite a bit away from the chapel. And it's been a while since I've been there at night, so that's why I'm kind of wondering. It's, 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 right, it's right up against the, the, the long barracks. The long barracks is right. It's right up against the long barracks, which I understand, but I'm just saying on the chapel portion, the, the, the postcard version of the Alamo, I notice there's quite a bit of distance. Lawn is in front of the There's a lawn, lawn piece that's, that's there, and uh, we, we can, uh, I think we can demonstrate that, that it is, you're pretty much right there right in front of the church. It's, it's about as close as, as people get. What's that? So, Councilman, I think the question is, can you today, excuse me, excuse me, can you today provide us with a photo of what the lawn is today? Can you today stand at night in front of the church, or you have to go where the lawn, like where the lawn starts? I can't step on the lawn today. I mean, but can, can you, you go past that point to the door, the room no. door? Mm -hmm. Not, no, not at night. No, not you can't. You can't do that at night. You have to stand with the lawn on your back and the church in the back, so the same distance from the dotted line is showing on the map. Yes. That is correct. Thank you. Walk up to the door. No, you can't. Is there any questions from the planning commission? One question on, on access that still seems to be um, heartache for, for others, and so I understand during museum hours we'll have that one access. Um, as I'm speaking out loud, it does make sense again so that you get the story. The story you need to start off with the beginning, go to the middle, go to the end, and so we're directing and we're um, unlike again in Boston, unlike the Freedom Trail, we start anywhere and I'm kind of lost and I'm not getting a story like it for, I probably should have. Um, but so I think that's our purpose and intent. Um, if we do get the, the numbers and the crowd and we do see people waiting, is that not an easy fix in the future to add an additional access or two or three? Um, because we already do have additional access points after hours. Yes, again, it's, a, it's also outlined in the lease in, in terms of, uh, you know, the goal, the bottom line is to, to not have any wait lines. I mean, that is not uh, part, of, part of the plan and, and certainly not part of a successful uh, direction of, of a museum. So what, what we in, intend to do is create a, a formal entry that is robust, that uh, is going to address all those concerns. We're going to be doing all the studies necessary, uh, working with the preeminent uh, design team to, to help address those issues. Um, the, we have built in two additional access points. We feel that those are definitely enough. Of course, all around the entire site, I mean, it's, it's quite porous uh, outside of museum hours. First, I'd like to thank everybody for being here. I'll be real brief. Uh, I'd like to specifically thank the staff for keeping the commissioners uh, very well informed on this in the weeks prior and answering many of our questions ahead of this. So a lot of what's happening here are reiterating uh, the questions. And I have one very specific question that hasn't come up. And that has to do with the Paseo, uh, the Paseo del Alamo and any structures 
that would be associated with the visitor center and the museum um, that would occur over the facility of <coughs> Alamo. That, that piece of property re is retained by the city and would fall under the purview of the HDRC, is that correct? Uh, well, it's it's a combination of both because we anticipate using the museum slash visitor center as a way to connect us down to the river level, and so it is it's kind of a combination of two. That would likely be an element that we would have a chance to comment on. That is correct. Thank you. 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 I would like, I mean, this is like our fellow commissioner here. This is the beginning of a very, very big decision. I implore you all to involve your next generation. You're all talking about who you descend from, and I don't see any young person that are talking on your, like as the next generation, which will be the generation that actually enjoy this. So I, I don't want to name so I just wanted to tell you. They got school. They got school. They know where they come from. Is there any they, other, know, uh, they know their story. They don't know where they come from. I'm prepared to make a motion whenever okay. we're ready. Okay. No further questions from the planning commission? Um, I guess at this point in time, I will close the public hearing for the planning commission portion of this meeting. Um, I said it earlier. And I just want to reiterate that while I'm getting ready to ask for a motion on this item, so while you're considering how you're going to vote, please remember that you're only voting on it. Cat, if you could put it up, <coughs> we're only voting on the road closure, the repurposing of the road, and the lease agreement. The rest of the stuff that we discussed today is not in the planning commission purview. So base your vote on that. At this time, I will entertain a motion. Motion. Do I have to read off the reading? Mm -hmm. Yes, if you could, that would yes. be helpful. I make a motion to uh, approve the closing, vacating, and abandoning sections of right away located on Alamo Street, Alamo Plaza, and Houston Street. The restriction of sections of right of way located on Alamo Plaza, Alamo Street, Blum Street, Crocus Street, and East Houston Street to pedestrian and emergency vehicle use only. The execution of a master lease agreement with the Texas General Land Office for property located in the historic Alamo Mission footprint and property required for the development and management of the proposed Alamo Museum. Conceptual approval of the tree. Uh, that's all. No, that's all. I will second the motion. Okay, so we have a motion for approval by Commissioner Gonzalez. We have a second by Commissioner Christopher Garcia. We'll do a roll call vote. Commissioner Cigarroa? Yes. Commissioner Gonzalez? Yes. Commissioner Christopher Garcia? Yes. Commissioner Azuna? Yes. Commissioner Kostic? I'm going to abstain. I, I think the uh, party is uh, fine. I just still have concerns about the, the lease agreement. And what concerns me the most is uh, uh, there's no assurance that those uh, right. three commercial buildings will be preserved. That's right. And, uh, so there's no discussion. We just need to know whether you abstain, yes or no. Well, I, I want you to put down why I, I'm abstaining. Thank you. Commissioner Brunson? No. Chairman Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. All right, I will uh, now close the HDRC portion and we will be seeking a motion for our minute. Mr. Chairman, I move to conceptually approve the treatment of the historic Mission San Antonio de Valero Plaza site and general design concepts to conceptually approve the treatment of public right-of-way including Houston Street to the east and west of the historic mission footprint and Crockett Street, Bloom Street, and Alamo Street south of the historic mission footprint to conceptually approve the alterations to the Paseo de Alamo 
and Maverick walk areas to include a new street level connection to the Soya Street and alterations to the Torch Friendship area to include a new connection to the river wall. And for final approval to dismantle, repair, and reassemble the cenotaph, Spirit of Sacrifice, in the Alamo Plaza at the approximate location of the existing bandstand. Second. We have a motion and a second, Commissioners. There will be a roll call vote. Commissioner Fish? Aye. Commissioner Wolf? Aye. Commissioner Bustamante? Aye. Commissioner Carpenter? Aye. Commissioner Group? Aye. Commissioner Bowman? Aye. Commissioner Lafoon? No. Commissioner Garza? Aye. And Chairman Guano. That would be Guarino. Oh, Guarino. I'm sorry, Guarino. <laughs> but that's okay because uh, my students from South Texas call me Guarino, and I'm getting used to it. So anyway, I am going by. Yes. Motion passes. Mr. Chairman, uh, prior to the adjournment, I would like to make another motion. I'd like to move for a resolution uh, that it be resolved that as the river building profit blocks and Palace Theater are historically important and necessary to a complete understanding of Alamo Plaza, it is the sense of the commission that these buildings should be preserved and incorporated to the greatest extent possible in the design of the museum. We have a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? All those in favor, say by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, say aye. Motion passed. Motion passed. Excuse me, everybody, please refrain from talking. There's still a meeting going on. Excuse me, um, committee members. The uh, resolution that was just put forth is not agendized. It isn't something that you can make a motion for and actually pass. You can, I think you've made it very clear, though, that you want that entered into the records in the minutes, and that can be captured that way. Thank you. As long as it's so bad. Okay, at this point it is 9.43 and I am closing the Planning Commission portion of this meeting. And I am closing the ERC portion of this meeting and we are adjourned.